Today on the Demystify Sci podcast, we are talking Shakespeare. For those of you who are longtime listeners, you will know that we have dealt with theories about the origins of Shakespeare before with Dennis McCarthy. But today we have a three-way conversation with three people that are involved in the story of Thomas North being the actual writer of Shakespeare's plays. And so we have Dennis McCarthy, we have Michael Blanding, investigative journalist, and we have Derek Hunter, who is a writer of a fictional account of Thomas North's life, in addition to a bunch of other characters that were around at the time who were influencing North's creations. Thomas North has been described as the Forrest Gump of the 16th century In this podcast English. specifically. <laughs> yes, today. Uh, uh, the Forrest Gump of 16th century English literature. Uh, sort of a man who was in all the right places at the right times to have covered the experience necessary to craft the Shakespeare stories. And it's a really much bigger conversation than just Shakespeare because it gets at this idea of how these mythological narratives get cemented in our popular consciousness over the ages and how that's playing out today, uh, say, with respect to academic research and the difficulty of changing our minds about the past. And so this is, of course, super hot topic for Demystify Sci, and we are going all in for it. If you enjoy the podcast and you are thinking as you listen, what can I do to support this incredible project? Think no more. You can come over to our Patreon, which is at patreon.com slash demystify sci. You can donate anywhere between $1 a month and however much money you have to spare, and we will appreciate all of it. It allows us to keep this project going without relying on advertisements and sponsorships or having to try to sell it to somebody who can act as a patron that will tell us what to do. And so we depend on you guys to support us. Please come over to patreon.com if you have not done so already. Yeah, you can actually become a $2,000 patron if you want. <laughs> I actually added that tier just for kicks. <laughs> on recommendation of, I believe, Michael Hudson or Steve Keen, one I of them. Steve, Steve Keen. Keen. I okay. think Steve, Steve Keen. Steve Keen has a $2,000 tier on his Patreon. <laughs> <laughs> We're manifesting. You never know. You never know. Um, Anyways, if you uh, want to hang out, we're having our first live event in Austin, Texas this year, April 7th and 8th, and we're going to hang out, watch the eclipse. There's going to be a number of speakers, and mostly we're going to just be in one place and discuss person to person, try to actually create some real life friendships out of this project, and I think it's going to be absolutely epic. So I would love to see you there. You can grab tickets at the Eventbrite site up here. Otherwise, sit back, relax, and enjoy our exploration of the origins of Shakespeare's works. The scientific revolution starts now. Maybe just shine a little light on why in the world we shouldn't be completely satisfied with the idea that Shakespeare was this one dude. From well, the, uh... yeah, go ahead, please. Take it uh, well, he was one dude, and uh, he was involved in writing the plays. He wrote all the plays. And it, the idea that uh, people don't think Shakespeare uh, was Shakespeare is, is, is very inaccurate. The, the layman... Lay people have this uh, view of Shakespeare as this lone genius going into his study and, you know, and conceiving all these great plays uh, by himself and all these tremendous storylines, characters, and passages. But the truth is, scholars know that he often used old plays and uh, adapted them for the stage. And we know that these old plays existed because there's so many references to them in early literature long before. Uh, that Shakespeare could have written them. There's a reference to a Romeo and Juliet in 1562 on the English stage before Shakespeare was born. Uh, so scholars have known that there were the early versions of Shakespeare plays and that they used them and adapted them. My book and Michael's book uh, just shows argues that uh, Thomas North was the one who wrote those early plays, and we believe we've collected insurmountable evidence to that effect. How does this come to be a question that you obsess over for long enough to write books? Like, I feel like this is kind of a glancing subject. People look at it and they're like, ah, it's crazy. You wrote a bunch of plays. What is the thing that really drew you guys into wanting to explore this question to such depth? I, 
could give that to Michael or or Derek? I mean, I'd never really thought about it very much before I met Dennis uh, almost 10 years ago now. And, uh, you know, I'd read Shakespeare. I love Shakespeare. I've, I've seen a lot of the plays. I've read a lot of the plays and, you know, really appreciate them as literature. But when I met Dennis and I found all the evidence that he had uh, amassed about this previous writer of these early plays, Thomas North, um, it just became so much more fascinating to me because Thomas North's life is fascinating and it really explains a lot in the plays and really makes them, I think, richer and deeper to read or, or to see. And, you know, I started out skeptical. I'm an investigative journalist. I met Dennis and was very skeptical of this idea at, at first. But the more we talked and the more I looked at the evidence, the more I started to believe it to the point where even in the writing of my book about Dennis and his theories, I became swayed and, and by the end of it sort of became more of a collaborator than, than a journalist. Uh, and I sort of described that, uh, that journey that I took in, in, the, in the book. Uh, and it just, um, there's something about it that's just deeply troubling to think that, you know, the greatest works of literature ever written in the English language, people are fundamentally mistaken about and don't understand in a way that would really bring them alive and really, you know, make them uh, even greater than <laughs> we realize. And because of that, I think it's just, you know, this is a mission that's worth taking and, and it's something worth exposing and, and worth, uh, you know, really putting energy towards. Is there something about Thomas North that makes him less appealing of a hero for literary scholastics, whatever you want to call it, the, the, the famed version that we have of Shakespeare? Is, is there a good reason why the image or the person of Shakespeare would be more appealing. Like was Thomas North a jerk or something? Yeah. No, yeah. <laughs> no just the opposite. There, okay. Thomas North would be, is the perfect kind of hero. He, because he was, he ended up uh, so impoverished uh, at the end of his life. And he was really an underdog and he, he constantly had fate go against him. And he suffered so much uh, in the last decades of his life. He would be a very sympathetic figure. The only reason that people are resistant to Thomas North, uh, even despite the evidence that we amassed, both the writings of Thomas North in the Shakespeare canon and his life, he actually lived the plays, is also found, uh, that are also found in the, in the Shakespeare canon. The only reason is because people are emotionally invested in William Shakespeare and what they have taught about Shakespeare, or what they uh, have believed, or they're invested in some other author or some other view of uh, of the Shakespeare canon. Um, so they weren't expecting this discovery. They knew that Shakespeare had written, had used old source plays. They assumed that they were relatively trivial plays and written by different people. So th when you find out that it's one person that wrote them all and the credit would start to shift toward Thomas North as the originator of the canon, rather than William Shakespeare, people start getting uptight because you're taking down the person that they've invested so much into. Absolutely. I am totally, I think that's the, the big thing of it is not that Thomas North is not appealing. I think the more you find out about him, he's absolutely fascinating uh, person. Um, he's actually f way more fascinating than the man <laughs> from Stratford, the man from, and for me personally, how I got into this was I grew up with a, uh, my stepfather was a Shakespearean stage actor from Canada. Mm -hmm. And he uh, was an actor who wor worked with Jason Robards and Christopher Plummer. And mm -hmm. they both went from Canada to New York in the, uh, in the 50s and 60s. And he, out of the three, he did not have a successful career. Uh, but so when I was a kid at home, I was constantly hearing Shakespeare all the time and musical tunes and just all kinds of stuff. And I just, it just was like uh, chalk on the board. It was irritating. It was annoying. I hated it. But when I was in high school, my first year of high school, I had a fantastic English teacher who made the plays come alive. And they were just absolutely just breathtaking. And I was like, holy shit, this is great. Mm -hmm. um, and then I had to write a, a, a life story on, Sha on Shakespeare. And from that point, uh, that's when I was I looked into the details of his life. And I'm like, this is not this doesn't make any sense to me. It's just like in. in for me, at the same time, I was also falling in love with James Joyce and, uh, and other writers. And there was a clear, like with Joyce in particular, there's a clear uh, connection between 
the person, the individual, and the work, and you can see the, the life journey, the life process, and with Shakespeare, that just wasn't the case. Mm. And, I, and I, you know, and there was also, uh, you can look at, it's not so much because of how far back historically, I think you can find the personal connection with Dante, who came centuries before Shakespeare. There's a very strong autobi autobiographical element in Dante's works. So um, it just was really bizarre, and that sent me on this 30-year uh, rabbit hole, basically. And uh, to be honest, uh, I changed my mind millions of times, both Dennis and Michael know that about me. Um, and I'm just really uh, finally, even though I have a slightly different take on it, it the, I still feel that ultimately the main genius is Thomas North. And I just was uh, extremely persuaded by the work that Dennis has done and also what Michael's done as well, too. There's a, there's a number of things that Michael has done that has really made it a clincher for me uh, as well. Yeah, Michael. I think that oh yeah, go ahead. I think that there is something that's really appealing to people about this idea of this lone genius Shakespeare, and especially somebody who comes from these more modest back background in Stratford upon Avon, who didn't have that kind of university education, and and you know came from more modest means, you know, was this glove maker's son. I think that um, there's something sort of romantic about that, you know, that anybody could sort of, you know, write these, these amazing plays if they just, you know, kind of put their mind to it. And that myth has just grown up over the years. And it's much, uh, I think it's less appealing to think that these works are works of collaboration that, you know, it was Shakespeare and Thomas North and maybe other writers involved as well. But if you think about it, you know, that's how a lot of great art is made. And, you know, the movies that we watch today are the product of many different people. There's the director and the writer and maybe, you know, the person who wrote the original book, the movie's based upon. And, you know, each sort of contribute their their piece of the puzzle. And it sort of becomes this work that's greater than, than the sum of its parts. So if you, you know, really take the time to look at it, it's completely natural and it makes a lot of sense. But, you know, we're just really attached to this idea of this lone genius. And, and I think that's really hard for people to give up. But and even even like major Shakespeare scholars nowadays in the 21st century are all like pretty much in agreement in terms of that. They were people they still believe Shakespeare was the main genius, but that he had a lot of people he worked with. So it's it's become a, a the idea of collaboration, which was like the norm in back those in those days, plays were written in collaboration. They weren't. It was very rare, like Ben Johnson was one of the rare people who was like, no, I'm writing this play by myself, you know, but like most people, they like, collaborated. It was just the process. They had to write plays so quickly, just there was a high demand for producing plays. So they had to have multiple people writing scenes uh, at the same time and then, that you know, get the plays out quicker. But doesn't this change in the origin of the plays just place the lone genius myth into the domain of Thomas North now? Well, uh, yes and no. Uh, we know that Thomas North, uh, it, the, the stories that he, were, he was using were not original, though I believe crafted into the plays and plots and characters and many of the speeches are Thomas North's. He's using old storylines. All four of Thomas North's translations are really collections of important stories or moral examples or uh, humanist le lessons from the greatest collectors of such stories in history, including Plutarch and Guevara and uh, Anton uh, Francesco Doni and uh, Cornelius Nepos. And so he was bringing together the greatest stories of history, which were developed uh, all over the world. Uh, the stories from in Donny are from uh, our Indian beast fables, and these were then turned into the Shakespeare canon. So it is, so even if it's coming through North, it is a collection of geniuses from the past, and he's just standing on shoulders and shoulders, and then Shakespeare's standing on Thomas North's shoulders. And I think the theory that Dennis has developed, and, and he and I and Derek may all have kind of um, different takes on it, and we should also mention June Schluter, who is a uh, professor at Lafayette College, who's also worked on this with, with yes, Dennis. Thank you. And we, we may each have a different kind of take on it, but um, you know, the theory goes that Thomas North was writing these plays for a courtly audience and writing them maybe, you know, 
20 to 30 years before Shakespeare uh, came on the stage. And then Shakespeare took these plays and adapted them for the public stage. Mm. And it may be that um, he changed a lot. And other people were involved in the rewriting as well. And, you know, some of these other writers that, that Derek features in, in his book. And so you see these plays as kind of living, breathing documents that were really changing over time. And maybe, you know, there were jokes in the courtly version that just didn't land with a public audience, you know, when people are like throwing rotten tomatoes and, you know, maybe some of the, the body or language and the sword fights and things like that were things that were added uh, by Shakespeare's company and, and added for the public stage. And so you really see the evolution of these works of art into, you know, the, the masterpieces that we see today. But you know, we sort of just look at the masterpiece and say, oh, it was just sort of conceived and written like that, you know, in, in a week. And uh, so it's not necessarily that that we're just replacing one lone genius with another. And it was really Thomas North and not Shakespeare deserves the credit, but really that it was this kind of collaborative iterative process over the course of, of many years or even many decades that really kind of created these plays. And I think there's something just really exciting about that. And there's a number of examples of that in literature, right? Like the the Brothers Grimm or the uh, Aesop's Fables, these collections uh, of older stories. And you see, even across religious traditions, stories getting handled, handed down from one generation to the next. It's right. almost right. it's almost as, as if there's no new stories to uncover under the sun, just to be retold in the times that we're living in. So I, I think, go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry. But just, yeah, just uh, uh, I think that maybe one of the great art forms of the of the 21st and 20th century is is, is film, and it's it's a collaborative effort. You know, I think uh, uh, a lot of people's favorite favorite movie of all time, Citizen Kane. Uh, you know, Orson Welles repeatedly you know gave credit to Greg Tolan, the cinematographer, to mm -hmm. the script, you know, to the actors, to the the editing. Just everything was just the the score, the amazing score. Just there's so many brilliant talented people who were involved in making citizen Kane. like sure like orson welles was the main driving force behind it but he couldn't have done it without all those people i actually when you guys when we're talking about this i don't know if you listen to a lot of radiohead oh yeah i love them but there's a crazy thing that happened to radiohead because if you listen to their very first album i think it was the bends mm -hmm. no it was the, even before that there was one but, Anyways, it, yeah. but their first album, it's basically like a Coldplay album. Pablo mm -hmm. Honey. Yeah. Pablo Honey, I think it was called. Like, it was just, like, I think that one of the songs is like, anybody can play guitar, and it's just mm -hmm. this, just, it's just fine. But then they get this producer, Nigel Godrich, yes. and the producer is the one that gets them to the place where they actually become whatever it is that we think of when we think of Radiohead. Mm, definitely. And, this is kind of the frame in which I put the story where it's like Shakespeare... He's also super shadowy dude. Like, he doesn't do interviews. He won't reveal oh, yeah. any of his techniques. He doesn't want to oh. really be known. He's just kind of back there, you know, doing that thing. I actually find this fascinating, and I did not know this. What's the name of this guy? Uh, <laughs> Nigel Godrich. But you, you, you'll be hard-pressed to find anything out about it, or like to really get his perspective uh, uh, you on You know who will find out about it? Michael Bland. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you might get some biography, but he's just, he's really, you hear stories from other people who have met him, like, they're like, yeah, Nigel Godrich said this one thing to me one time, and you're just like, whoa, it's super, like, deep wisdom or something, but. You should um, get him on the show. I just think he's, he doesn't want to be seen. <laughs> just going to camp out outside of his house. But he I think. a great album with uh, Paul McCartney. Oh, he did. I had no idea. Yeah, I think it, it's called something chaos and something in the backyard. It was like in the two thousands. <laughs> it's a really good one. Uh, it it's to me when Paul McCartney kind of hit his stride again in the you know in the older years. I have to check that out. But well, I think the producer with the Beatles also. Um, yeah, George Martin. Yeah. Some music insiders think he gets a lot of uh, should get up more credit. And yeah, right. Yeah. But great. I think that this is a common feature of these complex creative projects that we look at and we're like, well, clearly this is the manifestation of, of one person who has done this thing or like a group of people. And you only really realize how much goes into it and how many different visions are tied into it when you start looking through the liner notes and start figuring out the lore that's behind the scenes that tells you, well, well, no, this anomalous thing didn't come from nowhere. It, what didn't like spring from the forehead of Zeus? Like it's it it has history. It has roots, That's and so right. 
I wonder if we can lay some groundwork about what the conventional story of Shakespeare is, and then what are the anomalous details that set you down this road of all is not as it seems? Well, uh, so I would say the the lay person's view of Shakespeare, again, genius sitting alone, and it's the big bang of uh, of uh, the origin story of the Shakespeare canon, where all this, all these in tremendous stories and uh, uh, beautiful speeches just sprang out of uh, out of nothing, fully formed. Uh, scholars themselves know that there's a lot more histories, a lot more sources that uh, Shakespeare was borrowing a lot, and also know that there were source plays that Shakespeare was borrowing from old plays. They didn't know who had written them, uh, so you get a more uh, scientifically reasonable, coherent, I believe, the Thomas North view gives a more coherent explanation of the origins of, uh, of the Shakespeare canon. What led me first uh, to, to the Thomas North uh, discovery was that there were satires in the era in the, in the 1580s, 1590s, early 1600s, uh, Thomas Nash, Thomas Lodge, Ben Johnson, and we have a paper uh, June Schluter and I were trying to get published now that uh, which was the very one of the very first discoveries I made and then June Schluter and, and I've uh, uh, found other important evidence and we used AI to do it in which they are describing essentially the story of Shakespeare. They mocked all other playwrights, all other literary people of the time. They mocked other writers and they spoofed him. And when they did, they mocked their techniques and their works and their works of writing. And they also wrote about this, continuously wrote about this well-traveled, uh, multilingual, translating knight who uh, was writing old plays and this young upstart who was kind of imitating him and working it, and that's North and Shakespeare. And, uh, you know, uh, in Growth with the Wit, there's an argument that this person's getting too much credit for these plays and please stop uh, writing for them. And Ben Johnson wrote stories where he's got the Shakespeare and North caricatures on stage together with the one, uh, Thomas North being that translating Italianate knight who was uh, teaching his young protege in the ways of stagecraft and things like that. And the whole, uh, the whole uh, concept makes sense. Uh, I knew these stories uh, when I started looking up these stories on early English books online who they were referring to, these satirists, who it, it turned out they were constantly referring to Tom Snort. They were punning on his name. They were quoting his writings. They were uh, referring to his uh, various translations and referring to him as the author of the original plays. What, so, what year What year approximately were these satires coming out? Uh, so 1589 is the first mention of Hamlet, the Ur Hamlet, the original Hamlet. Uh, that's by Thomas Nash. Uh, a famous thing in which he attributes it to an English Seneca. And that's the very first work. I said, all right, well, we should be able to figure this out because uh, Thomas Nash, he wasn't trying to make a riddle of the ages. This wasn't, this is just how they wrote. They, they referred obliquely to the people they were referring to and they would pun on their names. He, he did it with uh, uh, Stubbs. He did it with Gabriel Harvey. He did it with, um, uh, Sidney, uh, Lily, all the other writers of, of the day, they would mock and they would pun on their names. They would refer to their writings. Well, when I started going through phrase by phrase of this work, because I wanted to find out the original author of this original Hamlet, it was clear that many times when he wasn't referring to Lily or other ones, he was referring to Thomas North and he's referring to this translator. And it was he who was marking him, marking him as this, uh, writer of Senecan tragedies and the original author of that, of that Hamlet. And then, uh, then, uh, 1590s, again, you would see it all through Nash and Harvey were writing about it. Lodge also wrote about this original author of Hamlet, used the same description, continuously, clearly referenced Thomas North quotes the dial North's moral, uh, North's, uh, dial of princes extensively. He, uh, has, uh, other references to Norris Plutarch's lives, and uh, and then refers explicitly to the Hamlet and the ghost who cried so uh, uh, miserably, like an oyster wife, uh, is a line from that Lodge work in which he's referring to Thomas North. 
And again, Johnson does the same thing. And what I think is really uh, interesting about Dennis's technique was he sort of found all these references, you know, to this play, this other playwright who he identified as Thomas North. And then, um, you know, as you say, Anastasia, he sort of went to the liner notes of the play and he basically took took the plays, Shakespeare's plays, and uh, put them through this uh, plagiarism software and identified uh, all of these lines that were uh, taken, you know, in some cases verbatim from Thomas North's prose works. And, you know, the problem is that we don't have any plays written by Thomas North, so we can't obviously check to see, you know, that would make it a lot easier to say, you know, uh, he is borrowing from Thomas North's plays, but he found sort of all these vestigial remains of um, phrases from uh, Thomas North's prose works. And, you know, just thousands upon thousands of phrases where, you know, anywhere from three words up until eight words where, you know, he was kind of using the exact same language that, that North was. And so in this really sort of scientific way, sort of was able to, uh, you know, attribute all of these these plays and all of these ideas and these lines in the plays to this earlier work of Thomas North. And and I just found that really convincing when, when uh, he sort of walked me through all of that. And I think what's important to understand, though, for people as well, is that that the concept of doing that is not necessarily new. There have been a lot of other people who are arguing for other people trying to say, hey, look at these writings, these poems by Edward de Vere, the Earl of Oxford. Look how similar they are to the poems in Shakespeare, Shakespeare's poetry and so forth. But the difference is the sheer volume that Dennis has come up with. It is enormous. We're not talking about a few uh, passages here and there, it's intense. It's like, and I think because of the technology that Dennis has been able to utilize, um, he can just come up with just one example after another. And it's just difficult. It's just like, it's the use of words is just in, in the way that they're put together uh, in the word strings and just the, 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 it, in, the, in terms of expressing a lot of times the same idea. Like it just, um, it's really uh, so far like, uh, I honestly have not come across anyone being able to refute that, what he's doing with, with that, what he's in, in, in those comparisons, you know, between Thomas North's uh, uh, prose translations and the, uh, and the plays uh, themselves. So, I mean, really, honestly, I, I did no one's, I don't, maybe they're just intimidated to even make the attempt, uh, but it's just, uh, yeah, it's just, it's the, the volume of, of, of similarities is just, uh, is enormous. So it's and they're distinctive lines. They're, so you would find passages in which they're clearly parallel passages. They're both talking about the same thing. And then they'll use language, the same lines, that occur nowhere else in the searchable history of the English language. So it doesn't occur if you search it. For example, there's a list of Eastern riches, whether Persian or Turkish, in which you describe a bedroom with these Turkish or uh, Persian accents and uh, with the gold and the silver, et cetera. And then you describe this farmland with some score milch kind of the pale. Now, what does milch kind of the pale means? It, it, you have to figure out that milch kind means milk cows and to the pale is a peculiar expression meaning ready for milking. Well, how many people in the history of the universe have used the phrase milch kind of the pale? Two, Thomas North and his Plutarch's <laughs> Lives in that one passage, and then the original author of Taming of the Shrew. And you can clearly, cl clearly the two passages are related. Clearly, they're both referring to the same thing, the same kind of description. And it's for a corrupt guy and his riches. It's a list of riches showing the bedroom and then the, uh, the, uh, the type of cattle he has. And it's the same line, milch kind of the pale, that, that no one, no one even knows what it's mean. It, it, it's a peculiar North family expression for cows ready for milking. And now multiply that by several hundred in terms of passages or thousands of lines. And you see this in every play in the canon again and again and again, where it's clearly parallel passages and a line that no one else has ever used before or since, unless they're quoting Shakespeare or they're quoting Thomas North. Okay. Before we get too far into the, Sorry, invest into the investigation, <laughs> well, I just want to make sure that everybody's along for the ride here who's listening, because I want to be sure that we set out what the conventional narrative is for Shakespeare so that we can compare okay. it to this a little bit better. And I want to understand better when that narrative appeared for the first time or did, if it happened in Shakespeare's lifetime. Obviously, if he was the one speaking to the public, he's probably reaching a lot more people. 
But can can one of you uh, lay out the traditional picture for Shakespeare very very briefly, so that people who aren't necessarily Shakespeare, you know, scholars. enthusiasts, scholars, yeah, for, for the normal person on the street, what is the conventional story for Shakespeare, and when did that first appear? The, the problem with Shakespeare, uh, you know, as Derek discovered when he was researching Shakespeare's biography, is that um, there's actually very little that we know about Shakespeare as a person. Uh, we know that he was a part owner in this uh, theater company um, uh, that was known as um, the King's Man at, at um, the Globe Theater. And uh, it was the Lord Chamberlain's Man, and then it became the King's Man. And we know that uh, his name appears on the title page of a number of these plays when they were published, the published version of these plays. And sometimes they would say, um, in the beginning, they would say things like, you know, um, newly augmented by William Shakespeare, but eventually it just started saying by William Shakespeare. And then there's a few references to him as a writer, other writers that have written about him and praised him for, for his writing. Um, but apart from that, you know, there's very little that we know about him. We just know that, you know, there was a William Shakespeare who grew up in Stratford-upon-Avon, who was a uh, glove maker's son, who apparently, you know, at some point came to London and, and wrote these plays and, and uh, was a part of this theater company. And I think it's the lack of biographical detail that has allowed people to sort of uh, attach whatever uh, they they wanted to over the years. And it really wasn't until the 18th century that Shakespeare was really kind of held up as like the pinnacle of, of English literature. And, you know, England was at war with France at the time and sort of needed this national hero and, and uh, sort of started, you know, holding these sort of Shakespeare jubilees and celebrating Shakespeare as the greatest writer in the world. And that's where this sort of myth of Shakespeare uh, started to develop. But, uh, you know, from then on, it's just sort of been conventionally accepted that, uh, you know, Shakespeare was this actor in this theater company and he wrote these plays and, you know, 37 or 38 plays, depending on how you count them. And uh, that, you know, among them are Hamlet and Macbeth and Romeo and Juliet and Tamey of the Shrew and Julius Caesar and all of these you know, masterpieces that we inflict upon school children ever since. Uh, but that's really, you know, the story about Shakespeare. And um, it's been uh, one that has been re very rarely questioned. And, and when it is questioned, mainstream scholars really are very quick to silence uh, any kind of alternative um, theories or representations of, of Shakespeare and how he wrote his plays. In, in terms of also, too, what, what we do know about Shakespeare was what, one of the things that turned me off about him was that the things that we do know was that uh, he wasn't a nice guy. <laughs> you know, he, uh, uh, he went after people for really small sums of money, suing people right and left. Uh, he, and when there was a, a time of famine, you know, he hoarded grain in Stratford. Uh, he didn't pay his taxes. Um, you know, uh, his, his children, his daughters were what, for the most part, what seemed like were probably illiterate. And yeah. so there was this in terms of, you know, um, and, 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 and it wasn't as if he was coming from a working class background. I think that's what for me mm. is, uh, is to understand is that there are these other writers that of the time were coming from working class backgrounds. You have Ben Johnson, who was, a, was the son of a bricklayer, you know, you have, Christopher Marlowe, who's, you know, one of the great uh, intellects of the time, uh, his father was a shoemaker, a cobbler, you know, and you have this one after another, you have these writers who were working class, um, but there, there is a, there is a, we, and we have, we have like what, uh, the evidence of an artistic life. You have evidence of somebody who was communicating with other people, writing, dedicating things to each other. There was that vibrant creativity that was there. And again, so I think part of the problem with the people who have denied Shakespeare's authorship is that they choose these rich aristocrats. And so they get immediately dismissed as being um, snobs, you know, and, and for good reason, because they make the argument that only a rich aristocrat could possibly write these great works of, of, uh, of genius. And uh, it's simply not true. Most of the great writers of the time were well, you're coming from the lower classes, you know, and they just happen to be educated and we know they're educated and we, we don't know, we don't have any evidence that Shakespeare even went to school. So, um, you know, we, and I think that's for, for 
anyone who takes a look at this, you know, I think it's clearly to understand that if someone is questioning the authorship, um, it's not that because he's working class that he couldn't have done it. It's uh, it's, it's simply that the, 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 what we have there in terms of his life story, it doesn't point in that direction. He was a businessman and he was the wealthiest man in Stratford. If you go visit his home in Stratford, it's enormous. It's huge property, beautiful, gorgeous. And um, he was he was a, he was a rich guy and he went about it in, in ways where we would probably question his, his ethics and how he went about getting that wealth. And so at the time of, did you want to, did you have more questions about this? Cause I feel like I have a good sense. Um, I think we're good. Michael mentioned something interesting about the reception by academics that I want to circle back to eventually. Yeah, but we go, can, we go, can go there. If you have something along Darren's, Derek's lines. We can. Well, I wanted to ask about the time of writing because somebody mentioned that when he began to write, it was adapted by the pen of Shakespeare, or there was this nod to the idea that they weren't purely his. And then at some point, he starts signing his names to it. But Thomas North is a well-known figure who's publishing stuff. At the time, it sounds like people know that it's Thomas North, but is it just that it's so oblique in the commentaries that it's hidden from from view, where it's kind of whispered about in rooms and it's not common knowledge? Like, what is the... How does that fit together? Like, how did what, how did we lose Thomas North? Well, I, I can't even tell if it was clearly known at the time that Thomas North was the originator. Because it sounds like maybe some people did, but maybe not everybody Just did. Just aristocratic people in the it court. Was, no, well, it was known among literary insiders. So it was known among the people... The literary insiders, Ben Johnson, Thomas Nash, Thomas Lodge, uh, people like that did know and did mock Shakespeare on that. The very, very first reference to Shakespeare, and this is conventional, is that he was an upstart crow. An upstart crow beautified with the feathers of other writers. Uh, upstart crow was a television series in, uh, in England. I think it's now just went off, but it was, which was about Shakespeare. It's a uh, very famous line about him. Crow is the uh, Horatian symbol. Horace's symbol for plagiarism because it's from a story in which a crow got all the more beautiful feathers of other birds and wore them, and uh, and that's what they were calling calling Shakespeare. And there's other lines about Shakespeare. Ben Jonson said that he would buy the reversion, which is the right to use, buy the reversion of old plays, and marks not whose twas first, and after times may think it to be his. He complained it complained about it by after times he means the future he's saying since he's getting old plays and not marking the original owner uh it's going to be a shame because the future is going to think that he invented them all mm -hmm. uh so these were common common arguments and uh, even decades afterward there were still references to this uh edward ravenscroft in the mid uh, 17th century said i heard from someone this is almost a direct quote i've heard from someone uh uh, conversant with the stage that it was Titus Andronicus was not originally Shakespeare's, but only brought to the theater by a private gentleman to be acted. The way conventional scholars deal with that claim is that Edward Ravenscroft was a filthy liar. Uh, <laughs> the, uh, and there's another one uh, in the early 18th, in the uh, early 1700s, in which uh, Someone saying, I heard again from uh, an old literary insider that uh, Shakespeare had a hired historian who would have starved upon his history. That's a quote. And he wrote all the plays and that uh, Shakespeare then added master touches to it. Again, this is considered false, but it's the same consistent narrative again and again and again that Shakespeare adapted old plays. And we know that Shakespeare adapted old plays anyways, because the plays are referenced uh, long before Shakespeare could have written them, he's too young to have written them uh, when they're being referenced. So, um, uh, uh, I hope I answered the question there. I'm going to go well, off. What, what, you, what you have to understand, though, is that what Dennis is describing is is how Shakespeare and perhaps Thomas North were looked at by literary insiders. The general public wasn't really concerned right. much with who was writing these plays. In fact, most plays at the time were written and even published anonymously. 
Now, that started to change uh, during Shakespeare's time around the 1590s into the 1600s when this idea of, of authorship sort of started developing and people really did put their name on plays. But in the time that Thomas North would have been writing in the 1570s and 1580s, it was really looked at, uh, playwriting was really looked at as sort of a lower art. So he would kind of put his name on his literary works like Plutarch's Lives and these other translations he was making. But, uh, you know, it was looked at, especially as a gentleman, you didn't put your name on plays or poetry because they were looked at as these more kind of ephemeral uh, artworks. So now fast forward to the time of the public stage and when Shakespeare is producing these plays at the Globe Theatre. And uh, Shakespeare is sort of the name that everyone knows because he's the the uh, sort of, you know, the producer, if you will, of the theatre company. And uh He's the draw that that's going to kind of bring people to the play. It's sort of like today um, you might go see a, uh, you know, a movie by Martin Scorsese or something because he's the director. But, you know, can you name the screenwriter of uh, Scorsese's movies? Probably not. Right. Um, and it's sort of a similar thing. It wasn't this conspiracy where, you know, people were trying to hide Thomas North's name or or there was some sort of you know, um, nefarious sort of uh, plot to, uh, you know, replace Thomas North with, with Shakespeare. It was just the conventions of the time, uh, the way that playwriting was done and the way that, that theater was presented, the, the name of the author, you know, as crazy as it sounds now, because these are the greatest works of literature ever, but, yeah. but it just wasn't done back then. Right. And it's also, like too, it's uh, the, the most popular play at the time that it actually ran through Shakespeare's period and afterwards was the Spanish tragedy. And that never had the playwright's name attached to it at all. It was the most popular play at the time. Right. We only know it was written by uh, Thomas Kidd because it was referenced in, uh, I think, in what was it, 1612? What was it, Haywood, yeah. who, who, who gave him credit? And then that yeah. wasn't even really acknowledged until like hundred over 150 years later when somebody was like, wait, hold on a second. This guy says <laughs> that Thomas Kidd wrote the, the most popular play of the time, The Spanish Tragedy. Right. So, Thomas Kidd's canon had to be recovered by later scholars because there was just so little mention of him and his plays were not published with his name on them. Um, and uh, the same is true with a number of plays. We're still trying to reconstruct the... Uh, the plays of Thomas Middleton because they didn't publish their plays uh, with their name on them. And uh, there was so few references, explicit references to who wrote it as, you know, as Michael said, what if you write today, or if you say today, you know, I'm going to see uh, gone girl, or do you say I'm going to see gone girl written by Gillian Flynn, by the way, or, you know, <laughs> name, you know, uh, you never mentioned the screenplay author. That's, that was true at the time. Uh, going back to the one thing, it's exactly like uh, Abbott and Costello's Who's On First. That's what we think of, Abbott and Costello's Who's On First. That's what the masses think of. But again, uh, it was actually based on old vaudeville routines. Now, vaudeville insiders knew it was adapted, that the Who's On First was based on an old vaudeville routine and that someone else had written it. But the masses at large associate Who's On First with uh, with. Uh, with Abner Costello, just as we associate now, Hamlet, Romeo and Juliet, and those with Shakespeare when there were early versions uh, of it. But to and also, know too, the just to uh, make the, the, the point that Michael was making in terms of the social uh, uh, standards or expectations in regards to theaters, right? Especially the public theaters that were considered to be a very uh, distasteful and lewd and dangerous uh, place for people. And so, like, for example, uh, going back to Thomas Kidd, he did publish something with his name on it, but it was, it was what was called a closet drama. So it was meant not to be performed in the public playhouses, but in private, that you could share it with your private friends and whatnot. And so that was his last play, uh, Cornelio, which was a translation of a French play by Garnier. So you have there, there are these instances of where people would be okay, like Thomas North putting his name on a translation of Plutarch's Lies because that had a certain social acceptability to it. But he certainly wouldn't want his name uh, uh, attached to something like in a, a play in the public playhouses where there was criminals and crooks and, and thievery <laughs> and prostitution and pimps and everything was, was going on in these public playhouses. So, um, yeah, there was a bit, uh, definitely a, a major social stigma attached to 
having your name uh, to the place. And there was also misattribution of a lot. Richard Barnfield, when he published uh, his second collection of, of poetry, Cynthia, he wrote in the beginning that he gave himself credit for writing The Affectionate Shepherd, but initially he published it anonymously. And he was saying, well, people were telling, telling me, did you write these two other poems? Because uh, we, it seems like it was written in your style. And he's like, no, those weren't written by me. So, but what I did write was The Affectionate Shepherd. And I'm writing this one right now, Cynthia. So, um, yeah, it, 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 I think uh, uh, it has to be understood by modern um, people that authorship was uh, very fluid. And I think maybe even at times the literary insiders who probably knew more than anybody, sometimes they could get stuff wrong. Mm. Hey, folks, we need your help really bad, actually. We need to keep this podcast going, and we're not going to do it by plugging a bunch of sponsorships and ads and things like that. We're going to accomplish that exclusively through listener support, which means we could really use your help coming over to patreon.com slash demystify sci and give just a dollar or two a month. And all of that will add up over time so that we can continue putting more and more time towards this project. Thank you. It, it seems like in order to be able to trace the provenance, even now, like sometimes you hear like a chord progression on a record and when you start to dig you can figure out that that chord progression came from somewhere that you actually are familiar with but it takes a huge amount of digging to be able to map those two things together and to link them and I think that to even realize that it's necessary to map it you kind of have to be a nerd about the subject to begin with like the people who are like, well, Abbott and Costello didn't come up with that are like vaudeville nerds. It's not your average, it's not your your average watcher of, of comedy. And so it's interesting that it was kind of the same sort of phenomenon even back in the day. Because I just, I have this image of the society as being somehow like s smaller. And maybe that's really naive, but I kind of figured that everybody knew each other and they would know the like the comings and goings of who's buying from whom and who's in who's writing what. Is it just that the group of people who were even thinking about it or focused on it was was significantly smaller than I'm imagining? Well, the, the crazy thing about it was that most of these plays were never actually even published. Um, you know, there's some crazy statistic that like only 10% of the plays from the Elizabethan period uh, were actually were actually printed and, and published. And oftentimes the theaters would only print their plays when they were desperate that because the plagues closed the theater and they needed money or something. And so they would sell them. So, um, you know, in general, you weren't going to kind of pick up a play, at, you know, the the market and uh, take it home and read it. These were really meant to be um, enjoyed in either, you know, a courtly setting or in the public theater. And, you know, one of the things that blew my mind when I started working on this is that um, half of the plays weren't even published during Shakespeare's lifetime. The only reason we have them is because they came out in the first folio, which wasn't published till 1623. And, you know, Shakespeare died in 1616. And, you know, these are not, um, these are not sort of the has-been plays. These are Macbeth and Antony and Cleopatra and, and uh, The Tempest, I believe. You know, the real kind of, you know, some of the, the plays we really think of as part of the Shakespeare canon. And, you know, the only evidence that we have that, um, you know, Shakespeare's name was attached to them is because somebody years after his death, um, you know, had the... Um, uh, the energy and foresight to collect them all and publish them in this this first folio, which really kind of establishes the Shakespeare canon. But, uh, you know, it's just kind of inconceivable to think now that people would have just sort of, you know, let these plays kind of be relegated to the, the rubbish heap, uh, you know, during Shakespeare's lifetime and, and never printed them or, or published them or distributed them in any way. It just it just wasn't really thought of in, in that way as as uh, as an art form as really something meant to be seen and enjoyed rather than uh, published and read. So then do you think that there's a bunch of other plays that were taking place at the time that we just have no evidence of that are of the same level of quality? So you yeah, think that there's just like a print. lost dark matter of yeah. plays from this era that are just as good, but somebody didn't publish them, and so they're just right. Yes, that's well, wild. Very, that's certainly true. Thousands of in the lost plays of uh, 
Shakespeare's England, I believe. Uh, the McGinnis. Oh, I don't yep. have it. There was a book that was just published about this and where a yeah. scholar went to try to find any reference he could to plays that we no longer have uh, copies of or, or even any kind of description of the plot or, or anything, just kind of, you know, maybe a mention in, in a, uh, you know, uh, journal or private journal or something like that or courtly rebels records or things like that. But, you know, just lost the time. It's thousands. It's many thousands. Like out of... Uh... Uh, over 3,000 from, uh, I forget the date, from maybe uh, when the first theaters in London were just starting to develop. The first really public mm. use for theater was 1576. Uh, and uh, he just counted them all. There's 3,000 up until 1642 or so, 3,000-something of only, uh, you know, maybe 500-something survived. Uh, the vast majority have been lost, and many of those would have been considered, certainly would have been considered masterpieces today. It is not, you know, one of the famous questions is that, you know, that, that I'll get is, you know, well, why would anyone write a Macbeth or an Antony and Cleopatra and then not publish it, you know, in order to, you know, to get their name on it, to make sure everyone knows that he wrote it? So, well, Shakespeare, for one, he didn't, uh, he didn't publish that that play either. It's just that no one was publishing plays at the time, particularly in the when North was writing in 1516s, 1570s, 1580s. And no one really thought that printing was the only way for your play to survive. I, printing was relatively not that new, but um, there aren't, uh, it really didn't become a, uh, a major force in England until uh, uh, the late 1400s in terms of what the what works that they were producing. And then, uh, and then in the uh, 1500s and before that, it was all a manuscript culture. Everything that survived from Plutarch, from uh, Ovid, from all the classical writers was because they were copied in manuscript. And there's probably no reason at the time that they wouldn't think those works would also be, cons be saved uh, with, uh, by manuscript copying. It was a manu primarily a manuscript culture. And, uh, and, it, it probably didn't dawn on them that if if my play is not published, it will necessarily publish. It will necessarily perish. If they, this new thing that they're doing, which they're printing, is the only way for my work to survive, uh, probably didn't dawn on it. And I mean, not to go too far down this rabbit hole, but the um, in fact, there was an incentive not to publish your plays because you were basically just inviting someone else to steal it and put it on and charge people money to go see it and, and you know, take away from your own income. So yeah. it was actually, uh, you know, a, a strong desire not to, to actually publish these things. And so, you know, when people ask, you know, how could Thomas North have written these plays and we don't have any, you know, copies of them today, you know, that's why, because they were, they were just presented at court or, or um, you know, uh, written in manuscript and shared with the actors who were putting in the play. But, you know, there was really no reason to publish it for the general. general there are so few manuscript handwritten copies of plays. There are zero manuscript copies of Shakespeare plays, unless you, unless you count Sir Thomas More. And, um, many people don't. It's hard to say. It, it, one, of the, one of the scenes in it may have been written by Shakespeare. It's a, manus it's a play in manuscript form. But other than that, none of the none of the plays conventionally attributed to Shakespeare survive in manuscript at all, and that's true with almost all other uh, authors of the time. There's very few manuscript play manuscripts of the plays because because there's fires, they're destroyed. When people bought the you know print, really was what say what manages to save uh, works of writing from uh, extinction. And when also, too, when someone were actually to say, uh, like a Ben Johnson, who went out of his way to preserve his uh, his his genius, right, his his accomplishment yeah. as a writer, he was he was ridiculed. He was ridiculed because there people were saying, how dare you think that writing a play and then publishing it and collecting it, which he did in 1616, he called it his works. And people were making fun of him for doing that because he was I mean, Ben Johnson was the first in England to collect his entire works that include plays and to make it seem as if uh, plays were significant, that they had real true artistic merit to it. So, you know, again, I think that uh, it really, people have to understand the, the social dynamics at the time in terms of how people perceived 
uh, these works. You know, it's, it, was, it was a different time in that sense in terms of what was valued and what wasn't valued. It's hard for me to not see this moment as being really valuable and tied into the age of reason and the philosophy that comes out of the next century, right? Because we're talking about early 1600s, late 1500s. Descartes is born in 1596. I think Newton's born like 20 or 30 years later. And these are the people that are setting up all of the modern conceptions that we have of thought and reason and science and philosophy. How are they being informed by this cultural foment that's happening in the plays? Is there a clear line from Shakespeare and Thomas North and this play culture to the age of reason? Because it sounds like what you're suggesting. Or the age of authorship, too, seems to be happening there, too, where yeah. authorship really matters. Yeah. Is that related as well? I absolutely agree with that. I, I do think that it, it, it wasn't as if the age of reason didn't come out of nowhere. Just like anything in history, there is a, a, there's a continuum. There is uh, things influencing each other. There is things a lot of time happening in the underground first, and it's kind of fermenting, like ideas are kind of coming forth. Um, you know, I think we have to look at also someone like Francis Bacon, who uh, was really big on pushing the idea of induction, which was a big influence on the scientific method in terms of, well, uh, we start with uncertainty to arrive at certainty. So let's look at what we have in nature uh, to find out if, if our theory is valid. You know, we have a, a theory about something, then well, okay, let's prove it. And that he was really quite, um, he was really quite radical in that sense, but I, I don't, me personally, I don't think that he was like the only person who thought that. Uh, he was ev heavily influenced by the French philosopher Montaigne, and uh, uh, Francis's older brother, Anthony Bacon, was a friend to Montaigne and, and basically introduced Montaigne's work to Francis Bacon. Uh, and there's, and you know, Throughout the centuries, there have been people who have uh, noticed the similarities between uh, from Montaigne's essays and the Shakespeare canon. Uh, Fr Friedrich Nietzsche said that uh, Shakespeare was Montaigne's uh, uh, greatest reader, that he was someone who uh, absorbs Montaigne's works. And Montaigne is a really important figure, too, I, I think, not only in terms of philosophy, but in terms of how we perceive ourselves in that he put his own his own self uh, a completely flawed and a mess and making mistakes and just talking about stuff that people didn't really talk about before uh, in terms of like, oh, we're actually worth talking about? Like we as a human being are actually valuable to discuss and explore and that we, you know, it doesn't have to be religious or political or anything. It actually could be just us. Um, and we're, for me, I truly feel that Thomas North was had a uh, some kind of relationship with Montaigne. They were the same generation. They both were born in the 1530s, and their their lifespan. North lived longer, but I I can only imagine. It's just really hard to imagine that there wasn't some back and forth influence between the two. And Dennis can definitely explore in terms of where North fitted in in terms of the. 16th century uh, 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 English uh, uh, Renaissance, but also heavily influenced by the continent in terms of the Renaissance going on there and the humanism and the Stoic philosophy. Uh, these are things that, while they were looking to the past, to you know, to to ancient Rome and ancient Greece, they're definitely for me anyway. I definitely feel that there was some looking ahead to something in the future as well. And uh, I, 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 for me, I find it in the Shakespeare canon. I definitely feel that there is a, a number of things that are pointing towards the age of reason and beyond. Uh, and just in terms of looking at, at people for who they are as people uh, and, 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 other, and other concepts as well. Michael, you've been nodding. E yeah. Um, to bring it back kind of specifically to North, you know, he's a really interesting figure because he's sort of at this um, moment in in England where the the Renaissance has sort of come from the continent and it's starting to to filter into England 
and these concepts of of humanist philosophy are are starting to sort of come into vogue. And Thomas North was trained in uh, the Inns of Courts, which were these sort of like proto law schools that existed in England. And uh, you know, while they did study the law, it was also a place for uh, ideas, and a lot of thinkers were sort of bringing these classical texts from Greek and uh, Roman sources and uh, reapplying them to, to current society. And Thomas North was pivotal on that as the translator of Plutarch's Lives, which uh, Plutarch's Lives is this collection of Greek and Roman uh, biographies, essentially, where Plutarch sort of compared a Greek figure and a Roman figure and sort of uh, looked at the uh, difference in those societies. And in translating this, um, North and, and other figures would sort of take these classical works and apply them to their own society. And we're often very critical of uh, the aristocracy of this, you know, tradition of monarchy, uh, or we use it to comment on things like the marriage question of Queen Elizabeth and the succession of the crown, which was something that was deeply troubling in England at the time. You had this unmarried queen who, you know, wasn't going to, to uh, pass down to, to a successor. And so what's fascinating about this is that you can see a lot of this reflected in Shakespeare's plays as well. And this is, you know, one of the arguments that uh, Dennis and, and I and, and others have applied to the plays to really uh, show the influence of, of Thomas North, because you can see these uh the way the stories are sort of applied really speak to the present moment. And they speak to the present moment of Norse lifetime of the 1560s, the 1570s, the 1580s, not to Shakespeare's lifetime, which would be later, you know, the 1590s and the 1600s. And so a lot of the uh, characters, a lot of the scenarios in the plays really sort of speak to, for example, the, the marriage question of, of Queen Elizabeth and even referring to specific historical figures from, from that time. And so just as, uh, you know, Plutarch was kind of using the Greek stories to come out on Roman times, uh, North was sort of using these older stories, you know, whether they came from, uh, you know, ancient Rome, like Julius Caesar, or these Italian stories, and using them to comment on um, his own time in in England. And that is something that I find just really fascinating. And again, sort of adds this new layer of complexity to, to Shakespeare's plays. So you can read them, you know, as a play with the, you know, characters and the scenarios that are really fascinating as a narrative, or you can read them as these analogies that really sort of speaking to the, the time in this kind of coded language, and they work on both levels simultaneously. And that's something that I think knowing this history and, and knowing a little bit about Thomas North and his life and his preoccupations really enriches and deepens the place. Mm. Uh, Dennis, did you want to add something? Uh, yeah, uh, yeah, that's exactly right. Uh, and going to the original question, the uh, uh, yes, there's definitely the humanist ideas that Thomas North put into the plays and that he was studying. Uh, uh, really presage uh, more democratic enlightened ideas that you find in uh, in the age of reason and uh, and the age of enlightenment in which uh, uh, you know don't get into unjust wars which you will see all throughout uh, Plutarch's lives and Dial of Princes and you find that you know in Henry V uh, King Lear's uh, uh, which is a play advocating charity for, uh, and particularly uh, uh, aristocratic rulers uh, should have uh, should take care of the truly uh, suffering those who are out in the elements and there's a, entire scenes based on that and uh, you know with King Lear saying I should have you know taken care of this and when he is left out in the in the elements himself and uh, uh, so the suffering of citizens unjust wars and evil, tyrants and it, it are throughout the canon and why um these people will be damned to uh uh the hell of at least immortal memory and uh and it all it is all all of this all that all those humanist ideas um are then uh, were then reused uh, in, demo in more democratic forms of government that were to come 
But you would pin the emergence of them on a connection to the ancient Greek and Roman texts? Like, do you think yeah. that it was a resurrection of old ideas that had been lost and now yeah. are put into the consumption of the people? Yes. You know, you'll find the same thing, something more direct on the Age of Reason is uh, the finding of uh, the manuscript of uh, De Verum Natura by Lucretius. And there was only one copy and it was found in a library, I think, in 1417 by Poggio Bacciolini. And uh, uh, that's, of course, the, you know, that kept uh, scientific materialism alive, the idea of scientific materialism, which is what then uh, uh, was used by uh, uh, De Descartes and Newton and, uh, and really transformed uh, uh, chemistry and physics for uh, centuries to come. I also think, too, in terms of the theater, uh, it, is it being basically uh, in, in England was such a, 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 an exciting uh, art form and it was appealing to the, 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 the people of England at the time in London. Um, it was, there was so, because it was so popular, there was this demand for just so many plays, uh, one play after another, after another, and there was so much competition and you had people who were, uh, highly educated who went to the university, but they didn't have jobs. Like they, there was this opportunity for education for the, uh, uh for, for the, the people of England's and yet they, the, the terms of the job opportunities, whether it be working in the church or in law and so forth were limited. So then a lot of them turned to writing plays to make money. Uh, so the, a lot of them were, you know, they were, they were educated, you know, and I think that there was, I think between themselves was this idea of, of, of a healthy form of competition is like who could come up with something uh, uh, new and who could come up with something fascinating you know, uh, the, in the the passage that um, that was so, was so such a big uh, uh, part of Dennis's story, which is this um, introduction to this uh, book called Menophon, uh, written by Robert Greene. Uh, it was the introduction was written by this guy named Thomas Nash, as he mentioned, and he complains about how some of the the the, the styles, uh, the, the the Senecan tragedy, revenge tragedies, have been so out of date. So I think that there was this big push for creating something new and like Hamlet itself is a very uh, kind of like radical take on the revenge tragedy. So I think that there was this, this culture of wanting new stuff. And I think with that, you have these uh, uh, amazing uh, things happening culturally too, in terms of like uh, that the, in terms of our solar system, it might actually be the sun that's the center of our solar system, you know, and you have a lot of things being questioned at this time in terms of how do we perceive the universe and our place in it and being people being killed for these re revolutionary ideas, uh, scientific ideas. So, um, yeah, I, I can, I can only imagine, you know, I, I think that Thomas North was a very, uh, uh, a deep, uh, um, individual and a lot of that incorporated intellectual thought. I can only imagine that he saw that what he was doing was some, some way, different and revolutionary as much as he admired the past as much as he was a man of the past uh i i and as much as he had to play the role of making sure he didn't go too far and in, in, in upsetting the authorities um it's just it's hard to look at the shakespeare canon and think that whoever created this was not someone who was thinking about the future in some kind of way certainly in terms of sexuality in terms of like what is pretty much across the board for me anyway is that most of the sonnets uh were written by a man to another man and are expressing a homoerotic love and it was in, in, in a way where it's uh the love is seen as as being uh, uh, uh intensely intensely deeply felt and and and, and worthwhile um that in and of itself, to to write over a hundred of the sonnets are are, are clearly uh, uh, meant to be written to another man. As someone who's taking a big risk, and even though the sonnets weren't published until sixteen oh nine, they were very well known. We know there were references to them in the fifteen nineties, being passed around in private. So, the person who I think it was Thomas North, you know, who wrote those was 
was definitely not a person who was a uh he may have been had had to have been because you could only be so progressive in those days but uh you know he was not a uh, a traditionalist in a, in a lot of ways Cer certainly not in terms of sexuality uh and uh i think that uh we, we we to look at the Shakespeare canon as as something that's out of date and doesn't apply to to the present day. I think is wrong, and I think that we do have to see it as being part of uh, something where we see people trying to create something new and something different. Uh, and I, I do think that the plays and poetries are 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 beautiful examples of of someone and some and people wanting to do something new. What's really um... From a journalist's perspective, what really fascinated me about Dennis and June and about their um, theory about Thomas North is that it's sort of equally reviled by both the mainstream <laughs> Shakespeare scholars and the alternative Shakespeare scholars. Yeah. <laughs> because, uh, you know, the, the quote unquote anti Stratfordians who think that Shakespeare didn't write Shakespeare. Um, they don't want to see any role for the man from Stratford at all. They want to replace him with someone else and say it was Edward de Vere or Francis Bacon or, you know, one of these other candidates. Like in and costume kind of, or like? Yeah, as sort of as like a conspiracy theory. I mean, I, I shouldn't use the word conspiracy theories, but it really would have to be a conspiracy. Like everybody knew that Shakespeare didn't exist or that Shakespeare was sort of this front man who, you know, sometimes people think he was illiterate or, um, you know, could didn't write at all. And, uh, you know, it was really this other author sort of behind Shakespeare and there's all kinds of political reasons that people put forward for, for why that would would have had to happen and um, you know because uh, Dennis and June and myself and 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 Derek um, believe that uh, no that actually it was much more banal than that it was just Shakespeare sort of using these older source plays and adapting them and that there was really no conspiracy needed um, so the anti Stratfordians really um, hate that, and they um, don't want to see any role for Shakespeare whatsoever. Uh, meanwhile, the more traditional uh, Shakespearean scholars look at this work and they say uh, that you're really attributing the genius of the play to Thomas North, and you're saying that you know Shakespeare was kind of taking these older plays written by North and just kind of rewriting them, and therefore. Uh, you know, it really blows up this this image of Shakespeare that we've been talking about as this genius who sort of came from, you know, the, the middle classes of, of Stratford and became this uh, writer that we all know and love. And, and, you know, the people have built their whole careers of scholarship on uh, for hundreds of years. And so to acknowledge the existence of these of these source plays and moreover to acknowledge that they were all written by Thomas North would just so radically change Shakespeare scholarship that uh, there is such a pushback from the academic community and that didn't surprise me to, to answer your question but it did really shock me at just how vehement it was and you know you think of academia as a place where uh, ideas sort of get put out there and tested and argued and, you know, the truth wins out. And in Shakespeare studies, maybe other academic fields as well, but I think particularly in Shakespeare studies, uh, there is just such a resistance to even looking at the authorship question. And I think in part, it's because of, you know, these years of uh, these theories about, you know, people like the Earl of Oxford or, or other um, candidates that, uh, you know, mainstream scholars uh, tend to to look at some of those theories, you know, really askance. But they they they're not even really willing to even look at what what is actually sort of a reasonable uh, interpretation and answers a lot of questions uh, right. for how the plays could have this wealth of knowledge and experience that you know really fits a lot better with Thomas North's life than it does with Shakespeare's life and and 
you know, scholars, either they don't want to talk about it at all, or they will just, you know, viciously attack it. And Dennis has been on the receiving end of that. June's been on the receiving end of that, even as a member of the of the Academy. And I've been on the receiving end of that since I, I started writing my book. And it's really been, been eye-opening to me in terms of uh, how academia functions. Right. And, you know, we, and this is despite all the evidence that we have, we have, we're making newspaper after newspaper on various discoveries that are simply indisputable. And, uh, you know, there's, uh, uh, you know, uh, Michael Blanding found, uh, is do has been doing a great job uncovering, recreating Thomas Norris library and going through all the libraries around the world to find different manuscripts or books that he wrote notes in. And uh, his discoveries have, have been extremely significant. He found a Cymbeline. Uh, uh, I'm sorry. He found uh, what I think is Thomas Norris outlined Cymbeline in a book, uh, Fabian's Chronicle, that he found at uh, the uh, Harvard, uh, Harvard's Houghton uh, Library. And, uh, you know, and this made, uh, you know, that uh, Thomas Norris uh, handwritten notes comprise the outline of... Uh, Shakespeare's Cymbeline, it made the Guardian. And uh, if you look at the passage there, there's a quote that Thomas North wrote in the, in the, uh, in the margins that's in. It's with the misspelling of the name Cassibulon and how he was, <laughs> he was granted a, he granted a tribute of 3,000 pounds yearly, which is in the play, that exact, uh, that exact quote. And, you know, and all the plot points and the other characters that are written in the margins. And, uh, uh, they just ignore it because, you know, to be interested in Shakespeare, uh, unfortunately, is to be extremely interested <laughs> in, in who wrote it. And so everyone who, so everybody who's interested in the subject already have an emotional attachment to their particular view of who wrote the authorship. And so hate me and June Schluter and Michael Blanding passionately. I think this, also too, it's like uh, if I the way I see it is this is that you have two different parties going on, right? You have on the one hand you have the Shakespeare establishment academia, and then you have the anti Stratfordians, and these are like two separate parties. And what they really enjoy, and this is coming from someone who's been looking at both sides for thirty years since my teens, mm -hmm. is really they're not really that interested in hard evidence. So. In both the, both like uh, social milieus, right, the Stratfordians and at times Stratfordians, they really get off on just sort of the attractiveness of like a theory, and then when it went, so Dennis is coming at it from a more scientific angle. He's providing actual, real hard evidence, and like I have never come across anything anybody who was really that dedicated to that aspect of this situation of the Shakespeare authorship question. It says, here, here's the evidence. And so it's sort of like you have these two parties uh, and they're just, they, they see it and it's just, it kind of destroys their, their worldview. And it's just because their people are so, again, like Dennis says, are so emotionally attached to their perspective. And it's really important to know too, in terms of people, generally speaking, uh, generally speaking, right, are not as emotionally attached to religious principles uh, nowadays as they used to be. So in a lot of ways, you know, you have like Shakespeare and maybe consider the greatest artist, not just writer, but the greatest artist of all time. And for many, it, it, they, they, it is, in, and I can speak for myself, I also have an enormous emotional attachment to the works and, and, and uh, I'm enormously emotionally invested in it. I think for me, uh, what's helped me a lot is being agnostic. So I'm willing I'm willing to be open to different possibilities, you know, and so on the one hand, I, I kind of can drive myself nuts because I'm so willing to change my mind about things uh, <laughs> because when I, when I see something new, I'm like, okay, well, this kind of makes sense, right? And, and, and I'm open to that. But in this case, in the Shakespeare authorship question, people are just so unwilling to change their mind when they're presented with something new. Um, and I think it's just that thing too, of just like, Dennis is right, and it's just like people don't like to admit that they're wrong. You know, it's just like they they, they <laughs> they're not really willing to look at it in a different field. I think maybe why Dennis, like in your first book, uh, "Here Be Dragons," was was there was more open ears about it. Is that it's a different field where people are really hungry for the actual truth, where they're really actually into the 
the evidence that's being presented. But when it comes to Shakespeare studies, uh, there's just such a romanticism there involved that it, it's hard to separate the, the romanticism from, from the evidence. It seems like there also might just be a baby with the bathwater phenomenon. If there's something, I think there's almost a hundred different alternative theories listed on. We find the Wikipedia page eventually. Yeah, there's eighty, at least eighty. If you go to Wikipedia, <laughs> they do. They actually do give credit to to Dennis. I saw that. Yeah, yeah Thomas North is on there, and they say, uh, yeah. <laughs> but you see this in science all the time too, where actually some, you know, on the other end of the spectrum, people whose ideas are. Rev, you know, completely worshipped people who win Nobel, Nobel prizes and so forth. They'll often occasionally have really terrible ideas too, and uh, it, it's just interesting how it can go the other way too, where people will accept wholeheartedly something that doesn't make sense too, as long as they they like the person to begin with. And in this case, if the if it just seems like the whole area of inquiry is polluted by completely crazy theories, then all of them are crazy, perhaps. Right. There's a special kind of horror that erupts in the eyes of a physicist when you don't have a physics degree and you're like, I am really interested in physics theories. Let me tell you what I think about Einstein. Yeah, it yeah. is, it just makes them go running for the hills because, and right. it's, it's, it's cemented in, I don't know if you've ever looked at, there's this crackpot index where some professor somewhere, I don't remember exactly where, but he, at one of the big schools put together a list of things that you can use to identify a crackpot in physics. And one of them is criticizing Einstein. Another one is saying that, you know, <laughs> relativity is incomplete. Another one's saying you know, the stuff about the speed of light. And so there's all these things that act as triggers that allow you to, to just not pay attention to what seems like cognitive dissonance, right? Because we, we right. have theories that we really love. People who spend their entire life studying Physics or philo I mean, philosophy is another one of those things that, it, you know, everybody has an opinion on philosophy, but people mm -hmm. that are professionally trained in philosophy don't particularly want to hear your opinion. And so it just strikes me as a universal feature of human study, where when people study for long enough, they fall into camps, some camp holds on to some amount of influence, and then that just becomes the baseline. And if there was maybe one or two people on that list that were potential candidates, but like 87 is quite the zoo of, of, of characters. <laughs> well, yeah. one, of the, one of the greatest ironies about it is that, uh, you know, you have the Shakespearean scholars who are, uh, you know, so dedicated to this theory of Shakespeare being this kind of, you know, genius who rose from from the middle classes. And, and you know, one of the biggest criticisms of anti Stratfordians is that they're elitist and they're saying that only someone with a university degree could, uh, you know, write the plays. And then you've got Dennis who comes along who has, you know, been researching this for, I don't know, what, 20, 25 years now and, you know, knows it uh, inside and out, but uh, doesn't have... Um, you know, a, a degree in, in, in English literature. And so he's discounted by, uh, you know, the academy. And yet, you know, Dennis is this uh, genius rising from the middle classes who has, who has come up with the solution to, uh, you know, the, the Shakespeare authorship question. And yet he's discounted uh, at the same time, you know, they're hurling these uh, uh, charges of elitism at, uh, you know, the anti Stratfordian camp. I just find the whole thing just incredibly ironic. That's a really good segue into something that we wanted to talk about, about like the parallels between then and now. Do you want to, do you want to lay it on the table, Shelley? By the way, middle classes is kind for me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, what happened in the middle class? Um, yeah, no, I, we're, we're interested in this cycle of history a little bit because before the break, um, I can't remember, some, we were talking about, uh, I don't know who brought it up, that this spirit of liberalism and humanism was appearing and people were hungry for, for something new. And that seems to not be an entirely new idea, right? There, there are tones of that in the classical, well, just saying classical antiquity in general, but it disappears for a thousand years, essentially, while, while the church has dominion. And then after the Enlightenment, there's this interesting period of great liberalism and people being interested in exploring all sorts of new ideas. But then in modern times, it gets even more constrained once again as the institutions take hold of the narrative. And I see this as like a cyclic behavior. 
And I, I wonder if there's a, a sense of how the elites at the time of Shakespeare or at the time of Thomas North were able, were interested in these liberal ideas. They must have been if, if that, they were the audience for the original uh, plays. Is there... Yeah. Let me take a little crack at that because I, I go into this at, in some length in my book. And, you know, what you find in the 16th century in England is this really fascinating moment where uh, you've got Henry VIII comes along and uh, breaks with the Catholic Church. And not only does he break with the, uh, he doesn't break with the theology of the church, but he uh, dissolves all the monasteries. And so suddenly there's all of this wealth that can then be redistributed in society. And so for the first time uh, in, in England, you have this uh, expansion of, uh, you know, it's not quite a, a middle class the way we we think of it now, but it's uh, all of these um, sort of uh, newly wealthy people that are able to uh, suddenly have power and, and influence. And this generation is also being influenced by this reemergence of classical literature and ideas like democracy and the republic that, uh, you know, haven't been around for, for a thousand years. And so there is um, all of this questioning of, um, of power and a lot of debate over, um, you know, the divine right of kings and uh, what measure of uh, power and influence the aristocracy uh, should have and what are the uh, proper uses of, of power and uh, you know, is it just for the enrichment of a few at the top, or is there some sort of, you know, more kind of uh, egalitarian progress for, for the rest of society? And what is particularly fascinating about this in the context of Shakespeare and Thomas North is that these are the questions that were being debated in the Inns of Court when Thomas North was being trained there. And these are also the questions you see over and over again in Shakespeare's plays. You could almost look at any Shakespeare play, whether it's a comedy or history or tragedy, and look at it through the lens of what makes a good ruler. You know, you can look at a tragedy like Macbeth and the way he sort of seizes power and then gets his comeuppance. You could look at the, the histories in which they're, you know, relitigating the War of the Roses and, and they're, uh, you know, seeing who's responsible for this, you know, bloodbath of, of the wars that took place in a previous generation. Um, but even the comedies, uh, you can look at, there's always some sort of like Duke or something that's acting badly, you know, as you like it, you've got the two Dukes and one exiles the other, and then the other sort of comes back in the end and restores order or, um, you know, much ado about nothing. Um, the Tempest, again, you have, you know, Prospero who's sort of exiled by his, his brother, the Duke. And this current runs through all the plays about uh, what makes a good ruler and uh, sort of comes to this conclusion that a ruler is not just someone who's sort of selfish and enriches himself and, you know, the immediate members of, of his family or the aristocracy, but does sort of distribute this kind of justice and this kind of um, prosperity more widely. And so I think this, there's a direct line between this kind of humanist moment in uh, you know, Renaissance England and, and early modern England and uh, this, you know, much more kind of uh, radical uh, egalitarianism that would, would happen, you know, 100 or 150 years later. But, you know, you really see this kind of germination of this, this humanist ideal that, that is sort of challenging this kind of idea of, of the church and, and of divine uh, rule and um, that's reflected throughout all of Shakespeare's plays and and again it just makes it so much more interesting and I think so much more um, fascinating to look at it through that lens and not just say oh Shakespeare was just somebody who was sort of you know interpreting these old stories and kind of coming up with these you know entertaining uh, plays but was really kind of grappling with these um, the real kind of central question of of that time. Do you have a sense of yeah. Why the ch does anybody have a sense of why the church let go of of its like wh wh how how did this freedom appear 
Was it just Henry the Eighth? No, they were forced to let go. So Henry the Eighth, you know, breaks with the Catholic Church, and then you know, uh, basically enlists his his right hand man Thomas Cromwell to come and dissolve the the monasteries. And there was all this sort of um, uh, he basically takes a survey of all the monasteries and finds all kind of iniquity and and gluttony and all of this amongst the priests and monks, and uses that as a pretext to kind of come and and dissolve them and you know, take their land away and basically give it to this new class of um, kind of, uh, you know, yeomen and, and uh, aristocracy that, that kind of creates that new wealth. And, and guess who was a major player in that, which <laughs> Michael, of course, brings out very well in his book and Dennis does as well, is Thomas North's father. Hmm. Well, can you, can you say more about that? that? Project. <laughs> yeah. I, sorry, I, t- I, t- I talked over to you. Can you say more about that? Uh, well, both of them, I think, I mean, I know a little bit, but they both go into uh, in detail in their books about that whole process and, and beautifully so. So I, I think they 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 have more authority on that whole, because it's, a, it is a very important uh, transition. You're, you're talking about a major cultural and spiritual and religious transition going from Catholicism to this new English religious state and the, the enormous, like Michael said, enormous uh, historical consequences, and so a big key player in that transition was uh, Thomas North's father. Yeah, yeah, he was. Uh, he had this position called the uh, Chancellor of Augmentations, which was uh, sort of a fancy way of saying he was in charge of distributing this new uh, this new wealth. And so he wasn't the one kind of um, making the the decisions, so to speak. He was sort of the one kind of, you know, taking orders from the king and, and, you know, his immediate circle of advisors and, uh, you know, keeping the books in terms of, oh, this monastery is going to go to this lord and and this property is going to go to this lord. But of course, you know, when you're in that position, you're also in a position to uh, give favors to people that you like and and uh, withhold them from people that you don't. And so he was, you know, intimately involved in that process of that uh, wealth distribution. And so Thomas North would have sort of seen this firsthand and really been involved in in this, uh, you know, the stakes of of that transition. It's a really there's a play about connection. the situation in a way too, which is a, a, another thing that is discussed in both their books is Art and the Fabrician. Yeah. Do you want to talk about that, Dennis? <laughs> uh, sure. Yes, Edward uh, uh, Edward North, uh, Thomas North's father, was in charge of the dissolution of the mon- monasteries and uh, part of the court of augmentations. And uh, he ended up with some of the wealth himself, and uh, he ended up giving a uh, uh, an abbey and land uh, around this abbey to his son-in-law, Thomas Arden who was married to his, uh, his stepdaughter, Alice Arden, who's Thomas North's half sister. And, uh, uh, there's the idea of the play is that the tragedies that ensued are the result of their being involved, not being quite, uh, not being quite, uh, uh, virtuous in terms of their land dealings and in uh, in with the uh, dissolution of the monasteries and uh, uh, what ends up happening is Alice Arden, Thomas Norris' half sister, ends up murdering her husband with her lover Mosby, who was a Thomas North family servant. This became the subject of Arden of Faversham, which uh, Scott, many conventional scholars now agree was an original Shakespeare play. It's now in uh, the Oxford. It's now in uh, Oxford's uh, 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 Shakespeare canon. Their edition of the Shakespeare canon includes Arden and Feversham as an example of a Shakespeare play. And uh, it really originally was written by Thomas North. And it's a reason he was disinherited because he blamed it on the, uh, he blamed the tragedy that ensued on their involvement in the dissolution of the monasteries. And it makes it pretty clear that, you know, there's, people that want the land and that's that want the land behind the abbey and uh that they that the thomas are knowns and he ends up getting uh his body ends up uh getting dragged to it and uh um and so there's even a work uh in the 17th century written by uh edward north's great 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 grandchild uh dudley north who who suggests that 
there was some ill will toward Thomas North because he thought that uh, that his father's involvement, Edward North, one of the sons, he doesn't say Thomas North specifically, but one of his uh, children was upset or did, was not in favor of how Edward North dealt with the properties of uh, the dissolution of the monasteries and did blame a tragedy on it. And that has to be our new favorship. So it strikes me that having a child that is so close to the direct will of the king, who is airing the dirty laundry of the family and the rulers, would be frowned upon. And yeah, disinheritance, I'm sure it sucks to be disinherited, but the fact that he kept on writing is kind of wild like if the king doesn't like what you're writing it seems like you wouldn't have a very long yeah. career yeah well he wrote that with under queen elizabeth and that was when uh the people in power were now mad at uh at the uh i'm sorry he wrote that during uh queen mary's time mm -hmm. when uh when the people at the time it was a catholic regime and were mad at the dissolution of the monasteries. So that would have been a very effective way of getting uh, of, of getting noticed by the Catholic powers that be and uh, pleasing them. And he went to, uh, in fact, when he went to Rome, he went with the, uh, as a secretary to the uh, Bishop of Eli, and he was very involved in, in Catholic powers at that. So it was a very pro-Catholic work, uh, Arden and Faversham, too to expose the sins of the dissolution of the monasteries. Uh, but then Mary soon dies and Elizabeth uh, is, is in charge. He ends up getting, uh, uh, he ends up writing under the protection of the Earl of Leicester and, and mostly advocating for him over the next few decades during uh, Elizabeth's reign. But he ends up get, getting in trouble for what works that are advocating Leicester's position because a lot of times they displease the queen or Burghley, and he ends up getting banished to Ireland. Spencer ends up getting banished for Ireland for the exact same reason. Um, and uh, and then he, he's stuck at, in wars abroad for uh, for the next few decades and, you know, having to fight in the Low Countries in 87, 88. He ends up at the Siege of Rouen uh, in 92 and again fighting in Ireland in, uh, uh, first in 1580 and then in 1596 again. So. It's a tough life because of his his plays that were um, a little too critical of certain. It's, it, it's pretty clear that if you look into his life, that they, they they didn't want to like literally kill him, but they wanted to put him in positions where if it happened, oh well, you know, <laughs> it's that, it's yeah. sort of like uh, he, he, you know, and 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 it after fifteen eighty after he goes to Ireland, uh, he is a destitute man. And that's one of Dennis's arguments as to why he sells his plays to Shakespeare is that the guy was barely survived. You know, he was not, he was struggling. He was really struggling in poverty for the, and this, he's not a young man. You're when in 1580, he is uh, 45 years old. So from 45 years old until, uh, well, I believe he died in 16, at least 1607 because there's a reference to a Sir Thomas North in a land dispute in Yorkshire in 1607. So he would have, if that's him, he would have lived until at least then. And so he would have lived after his 70th birthday. He lived the remainder of his life in, in poverty, you know, and uh, uh, he struggled. He definitely didn't make it easy for him by any stretch of the imagination. And he really was caught in uh, situations where he didn't really have a whole lot of, um, uh, uh, freedom or ability to do things, he was kind of forced, like he was forced to be a puppet for Leicester because Leicester had an agenda. He wanted to get married to the queen, you know, and so uh, uh, he he used ta a new North's talent to do so. And North really, he didn't. So for North, he was the same generation as Thomas Sackville and to have very similar early life uh, trajectory but for whatever reason, Sackville became this enormously successful statesman and businessman and for the rest of his life. And even when it transitioned to King James in 1603, uh, Sackville continued to be highly, highly successful. So you have Sackville on the one hand, an example of someone who, who really 
uh, succeeded in, 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 in the society's eyes, you know, so to speak. And you have North, who so at some point, I feel, was some point in the, in the early 1560s, who just kind of like, he just, he struggled. You know, he struggled uh, for whatever reason, socially. Perhaps it was the Arden Faberge play. Perhaps he was, at least I, my feeling was socially still a Catholic when the, the queen was still, uh, when, when the queen now was no longer Catholic, or uh, is there is references to that uh, by the Dudley gentleman that, that Dennis mentioned. Um, so I think that he was not in favor for most of his life. He's really struggled and had a hard time. Um, in terms of how he was able to get away with stuff, I, I, I have no proof for it. But in my novel, I kind of go into and explore the reasons why he did survive and he and the plays did exist and they were out he was able to get them published how he was able to uh even just think of writing scandalous uh, uh poetry like the sonnets and also the two two major publications of poetry venus and adonis and the rape of lucrece in 1593 and 94 how he could get away with that because those were not by any means uh, uh safe works of art at all uh, they were very scandalous. And so for me, I do believe that there was some kind, North had some kind of protection. And uh, again, I have no proof for this. I have no evidence. It's just a theory. And that's why for me, I wanted to explore that element in a fictional account. So I didn't want to make a claim that this was real. This is just an, a fictional explanation for how were these plays even, you know, let alone created, but then put out there into the public. Uh, and then by the end by 1623, we have the first folio and that's where you have like half of the plays being published for the first time. And they are brilliant. They're they're Most of them are far better than the uh, uh, quarto, the single edition plays that were published at the time. Uh, so you have, I think that there was something going on. And again, I, ex I explore it in, 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 in the, in the way of how uh, uh, he was, um, able to survive and continue to do his work but they certainly this, the, the powers of it be the elite did not make it easy for north at all they did not make it easy for him one bit and uh he just was a he was a, a survivor he was a survivor and uh and, and and again for me i think he was a radical he was absolutely a radical and he had to play the game he had to make it clear that he was a patriot and he was you know he had to, he had to kiss some aristocratic butt for sure to survive but i think in his heart i think he was a true was a true revolutionary folks we are less than two months away from our very first in-person event we are hosting demysticon 2024 in austin texas to coincide with the total solar eclipse that is happening on the 8th. We have a venue rented for the 7th and 8th. We're going to have two days of talks, conversations, workshops, posters, hanging out. If you are able to come, buy tickets now at the Eventbrite link that is up here. And if you're thinking about maybe coming and you're not sure if you can afford the ticket price, reach out because we do need volunteers. We'll see you soon. What was the fictionalized story that you came up with for how he was protected was it based in research that you had done and kind of pulled things together or is it pure speculation a combination of both for sure for sure for sure so i think that um uh i have i've i've got a lot of interest in terms of uh, uh what i'm into and I, I won't go into it all here but um in terms of the in terms of in terms of the 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 things going on behind the scenes, and I, I don't want to go into like, say, like conspiracy theories and whatnot, because again, uh, I want to kind of stay away from that. But what we do well, those know, play really well on YouTube. I'm just saying. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> but I, we, <laughs> I, so we're, we're not trying to we're not trying to do that here. So um, I, I I'll, I'll just say that um, I I you know there there is definitely evidence that there were people in positions of power who were not too happy with the church and they had enormous power and that they also were kind of like in a way weirdly radical as long as they didn't challenge their power right so um there are there, there's definitely people who were in those times who for example embraced uh bisexuality homosexuality and other things that were were very dangerous to put forth, and yet they uh, 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 
they were somehow able to 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 survive. There's this one author. He is a um, he's a favorite of Christopher Marlowe, and also Thomas Nash mentions mentions him as well. And uh, I forget the guy's name, but he was uh, in Venice, and he was um, he had a uh, 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 basically he had like kind of a, a blackmailing uh, 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 situation where he would find out information about powerful mm -hmm. people and would uh, and basically keep that information. Uh, this guy was a playwright. He was a poet. Uh, I mean, he had his portrait done by Titian three times. Mm -hmm. And uh, what I, the point I'm trying to get here is that what I came across is that um, there were uh, definitely uh, examples of where um, people were able to get stuff done, and I don't think they would have got it, gotten it done on their own uh i think that there were certain people that were able to make it make it happen um so uh it just it, it just to me i think it, you could it could be fine to explain the situation where it it just happened by accident um but when we're thinking about it if you're thinking about the shakespeare canon so it, it really is starting with thomas north uh in the 1550s and then you're seeing it being completed by 1623. Mm -hmm. I, I don't, it's just, I, it's hard for me. I think there was a lot of accidents that were happening. There was a lot of sloppy, messy stuff happening and just sort of like, oh, okay. But I think to to see it to, that's that you're looking at it from like a, almost a 75 or 70 year period of this concerted effort, why these plays were, why they survived and why did why didn't like why didn't like thousands and thousands of other plays why why were they all lost while these like why were why was thomas north's works preserved to such an extent um because there no one else was doing that no one else you know you have ben johnson the closest you know person in terms of the theater world but in terms of the shakespeare canon i do feel like there was this concerted effort and that you know uh, why was it, for example, like in the 1590s, uh, you were you were not allowed to do make any mention of what was uh, Richard II. So Richard II was, uh, you know, Queen Elizabeth referred herself in comparison to Richard II, and and it was and she there's a it, there's documented where she is actually quoted as saying, "Don't know you not I that I am he I am Richard II." So it was, it was it was forbidden to for anybody to even discuss Richard II or Henry IV. Henry IV was the person who usurped the crown, who took over Richard II's crown. So you're having in the heat of this, right? In the heat of this debate, in the heat of where the succession uh, question, who's gonna who's gonna follow Queen Elizabeth? Because everyone's waiting for her. She's in the uh, twilight of her reign. And like, and there's a, a, a just you know, people are being uh, uh, imprisoned for even mentioning it and publishing books about it. But you have in the 1590s and also in 1600, you have uh, Richard II uh, by Shakespeare, and um, none of the the acting uh, the people in, uh, in in Shakespeare's company are public are, are punished for uh, uh, the uh, uh, production of Richard II. Shakespeare is not punished. And uh, Thomas North is not punished. Um, and so it, um, in, in, and this is in comparison to, to like so many other people, Ben Johnson being constantly put into jail, Thomas Nash being put into jail, other writers, uh, possibly Christopher Marlowe was killed for similar reasons and, you know, and then, his uh, uh, roommate Thomas Kidd was uh, arrested and tortured on charges of atheism, and so why is it that you know, like Shakespeare never was ever reprimanded for anything, and 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 uh, at this time, and if it was North who was behind Richard II, why wasn't he, uh, uh, you know, punished? So for for me, from my perspective anyway, was that there was some element, even though the elites were not. Powers that be were not happy with Thomas North. Why was it that he was able to survive as long as he did, and why was he able to produce the works that he did? And so I had to kind of like come up with my own theory behind it. Um, but again, because you're talking about 
things that are behind the scenes that to find the evidence of those things it's very difficult and so that's why i i never wanted to put it out as if like yeah this is for sure this is the truth this is a work of nonfiction. it's like well no it's is this is a story that i'm telling and this is how it, it makes the most sense to me That makes a lot of sense. I mean, there's there's a tremendous challenge to to uncovering sufficient evidence to put together an evidence based story from something that happened so long ago. Uh, well, the reason that I think uh, uh, that what occurred that Thomas North, like Edmund Spencer, and um, uh, even Philip Sidney, uh, didn't get away with what they were. Uh, Publishing under and producing for Lester uh, regarding the Alan Stone marriage or uh, other criticisms uh, that they had of Burgley, also uh, that was in the works of uh, Edmund Spencer and Thomas North. And then they were kind of banished, and Edmund Spencer and Thomas North, being less powerful, were really bore the brunt. Mm -hmm. uh, but the reason the with Richard the Second and Henry the Fourth, they became very controversial after the Essex Rebellion because Essex, uh, because the plays the Richard the Second specifically was kind of adapted to uh, to put to compare Essex. This is not controversial. This is accepted and conventionally that Henry the Fourth is compared to Essex explicitly. Richard the Second is compared to uh, is compared to uh, Queen Elizabeth, and there's a usurper, usurpation in which uh, Henry the Fourth takes over and deposes uh, Richard the Second, and they show Richard the Second is kind of weak and uh, and uh, a bit of a basket case, and uh, and doesn't really have uh, uh, doesn't have any uh, successor for the crown, and Henry the Fourth uh, takes over as a more dashing figure, and that's supposed to be Essex, and Richard II is supposed to be uh, Queen Elizabeth. This is actually brought up during the trial of Essex, and the day before the rebellion, he has Richard II performed, Essex does, performed by Shakespeare's company at the Globe, hoping that it'll rally people to his side in London for the uh, planned rebellion the next day. It doesn't work. Uh, and, and I, I don't I, I don't know enough history to be able I don't know about this Essex rebellion. Can you give a little <laughs> bit of background? I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it's six uh, early sixteen hundred or sixteen oh one, sixteen hundred, uh early sixteen hundred. Um the Earl of Essex, who was kind of a uh uh a little bit beloved figure, a man of the people, as is Henry the Fourth in 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 the play Richard II, uh, and uh, he was very temperamental and somewhat wild and uh, a loose cannon. And he was sent to Ireland uh, to uh, to quell the uh, uh, the uh, the rebellion that was going on there. But he ends up. Uh, Kind of losing it. He's not given enough money. He, he, he does. He can't really fight the war the way he wants. Uh, he thinks Queen Elizabeth is making a lot of mistakes, and he he rushes back and uh, and uh, confronts her about it in a rather dramatic fashion. But eventually, uh, the idea was that he was he decided to try. He had enough people on his side that he could take over that he could take over England and take over the crown. Though he kind of denies that was his plan, uh, but um, uh, that's what occurred. And he used Richard II to to help him with the rebellion, and other noblemen were involved. Uh, Thomas North was not only uh, not punished for it; he was rewarded. He got the biggest reward of anyone for helping put it down. And uh, the reason I believe, I think it's quite clear if you go through all the evidence, which I won't bore you with now. That the original play, Richard II, with Richard II as Queen Elizabeth, was originally written uh, during uh, the late 1570s with the other early English histories, which are clearly from the 1570s. 
And it was to, uh, and it was on behalf of Leicester. And this is one of the reasons, and that plays on Henry VI, or one of the reasons that North was already banished. He didn't get punished for it because his argument would have been, well, he wrote it for Leicester and it had nothing to do with the Essex Rebellion. And, um, and, uh, and Essex just used it for that purpose. And I think he may have even warned the Queen, and Shakespeare may have warned the Queen. Uh, or the crown, at least, of people involved that uh, once they performed the play that the the rebellion was coming. So they were ready for it. And uh, and we don't know, other than that, we don't, Thomas North got the highest reward of anyone in putting down the Essex Rebellion. We don't know why exactly. He got 10 pounds, and right after that, he then got a uh, annuity from the Queen for 40 pounds a year. Uh, these are facts. We don't know ex- the explicit reason, but I believe the Tempest tells you the reason, which is that, uh, which is about, uh, rebellion and, and it's that he warned, uh, the people in charge that it was coming. What's interesting too, is that, um, uh, for the, uh, for, for, um, for Thomas North, you know, uh, in terms of the situation, he, um, you know, he, he, was not only rewarded too, but he also he uh, uh, I think uh, he also was given a uh, not only rewarded for that, but like I think a yearly yeah thing. an annuity yeah yeah an annuity yeah. twenty pounds a year and and so it it is amazing like how how that whole situation happened and this is like and not too long ago you had a play called The Isle of Dogs which mm-hmm. uh, was written by Thomas Nash and then probably Ben Johnson Thomas Nash like he runs away. From the authorities and he's able to get away and he goes up uh, north of london hides out ben johnson gets arrested and um and then the players were involved in it too so a few other players got arrested too and were tortured and so it was you know a, a difficult thing and yet you I, and nothing happened to shakespeare's company either and um so it's, it's just it's an odd situation it's hard to explain and i was just curious like because I think that I think I agree with Dennis. I think the majority of the play Richard II was written in the in the late 1570s. Um, but I, I do feel that there was probably some revisions that were happening in the 1590s. We have there is a, 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 a you know we, we we do know there's reference to to the play in the late 1590s uh, as well as in the pub, in the production of 1600. And it's just um, no one gets get gets punished for it and. Um, you know, it it is it's, it's a mystery. I think there's an element. To, it's hard to explain. It could be just something that it just they just didn't feel the need they, to punish them. But uh, they it, questioned. It, they questioned a uh, yeah Giles uh, Giles Anderson. I think uh, one of the Shakespeare players. Uh, for what? Why did you put this play on? And uh, they were saying it's not us. That you know the uh, Essex had uh, someone come to them and. Uh, so, you know, asked them to put the play on, and they said no. The play's so old and out of date, and they gave them extra money to put the play on. So we did it, and that was uh, uh, satisfactory. There was no; uh, it, it, they were. It seemed fairly certain to the to the investigators, um, Francis Bacon being one of them, that uh, the Shakespeare Company had nothing to do with the that rebellion, and and really. Um, they weren't even the originators of the play and it was an old play and out of date. Right. <laughs> Let me just uh, break in here to say that, you know, without getting kind of too deep in the weeds of, of English history, I think the, the, you know, main takeaway from this is, is that in Thomas North, you had someone who was intimately tied up in the events of the period. I call him, uh, you know, the Zelig of the 16th century or the Forrest Gump of the 16th century. Cause like, he always seemed to be kind of in the place where things were happening. And, yeah. you know, in the 1550s, he goes on this delegation to Rome to try to reconcile England with the Pope. And then, uh, you know, in the 1560s and, and 70s, he is linked to this um, uh, Earl of Leicester, who we've spoken about a number of times, who is sort of Elizabeth's favorite. He was the one who everyone thought was going to marry Queen Elizabeth. Uh, of course, that never happened because she remained unmarried. But 
for a long time, uh, there was all of this debate about who Elizabeth was going to marry. Was she going to marry the French Duke of Alençon? Was she going to marry the Spanish Duke? Or was she going to marry uh, the Earl of Leicester? And we have um, receipts from the Earl of Leicester to Thomas North, which we think were four plays that Thomas North was writing actively advocating for the Earl of Leicester and against some of these other candidates. And uh, there was this big party in 1575 at the Earl of Leicester's castle called the Kenilworth Festival, which was sort of, you know, the biggest rager in the 16th century in England. And uh, a lot of people see this as, as an influence on Shakespeare's A Midsummer Night's Dream, that a lot of the entertainments there were sort of featured in A Midsummer Night's Dream. And, and so, you know, you have that connection that Thomas North was sort of there when this party was happening. And then he goes to war in Ireland and he goes to war in the Netherlands. And you have, you know, these Shakespearean plays that are all about war and, you know, Henry V, the big, you know, war play. And, um, you know, sort of one after another, you can see how the plays sort of map on to Thomas North's life and, you know, both in kind of general themes, but also like very specific uh, scenes in the plays that uh, reflect things that were, we know happened to Thomas North in certain battles that took place or certain, right. um, you know, he was a diplomat to France at a certain point. Uh, he was tied to the Earl of Essex, who was the one who later, you know, uh, rebelled against uh, Queen Elizabeth. The Earl of Essex was the one who knighted Thomas North and actually, you know, made him Sir Thomas North. And um, so you just see, it just becomes this much more exciting story. Like, I just really, you know, someday want to write like the streaming series of Thomas North and have it, you know, yeah. uh, uh, developed over, you know, four seasons of, of just... Um, <laughs> really compelling drama that's taking place in Thomas North's life and in the life of the court. And then you see reflected over and over again in these plays. And, um, you know, you can't do that with Shakespeare. As far as we know, you know, people talk about Shakespeare's lost years, which are, you know, this sort of like eight year period. They try to cram all this experience into and say, oh, maybe he fought in a war. Maybe he was a diplomat. Maybe he traveled to America or, you know, who knows where. Uh, Italy. Yeah, maybe he was in Italy. Um, and yet, you know, we have Thomas North, who actually experienced all of these things, who did travel to Italy, who did fight in war, who did, uh, you know, take part in these intrigues at court. And uh, it's just a much more plausible explanation for how this stuff actually got into the plays and, you know, added to some of the literary evidence that that uh, Dennis has, has also gathered. It really, it really creates a compelling case. Right. As I like to say, the uh, uh, if you were to take the set piece scenes of each play from when they were the source play was originally written and you can independently date it forget thomas north here you can independently date each of the source scenes each of the set piece scenes uh and you just put a picture of that on a timeline starting in the 1550s the picture of the set piece scene for arden of faversham and then winter's tale and henry the eighth and keep on going titus andronicus romeo and juliet into the 1570s, and as Michael said, with the uh, the kind of, uh, with a Midsummer Night's Dream, where it would be placed, where the English histories would be placed, the war plays, etc. And you keep on doing this, you go for about 50 years, and those pictures of each scene of the Shakespeare play gives you a pictorial biography of Thomas North, year by year, play by play. That's what each set piece scene shows you what is happening to Thomas North at that point. He experienced these scenes, these images. Our Nefever Sham was about his half sister and uh and his and a family servant and the murder, the murder of uh half century, uh the murder of the century at that time, that North actually knew all the people involved. So that's that's why that's there. He was at the Kenilworth festivities. He was at war in Ireland. And as Michael said, the with Henry V actually refers, uh, describes the French war and is compared to the current war in Ireland. And uh, lots of scholars know, and it's, this is conventional, that it's used as a proxy to show the events of the wars in Ireland. And it just keeps going year after year, scene after scene. Henry VI Part One is... Uh, has scenes from the Siege of Rouen that was occurring at that time, and that's where Thomas North is. As You Like It is set in uh, in the Low Countries, the Forest of Arden, with a band of outcasts uh, who were banished, and that's where uh, Thomas North is, in the Low Countries, uh, near the Forest of Arden, or possibly in it, with 
a band of outcasts. And it goes on and on and on. And it's not just Thomas North's life. It's Thomas North's passages that are in the plays at the time. So it's Thomas North's, it's just his passages, his life. And if people just, you know, check it out, if they check out uh, the books uh, that we've written here, it'll be quite clear uh, what occurred. So what does it take? Like what is it? Cause so the, uh, it, I feel like Netflix would be interested in this. <laughs> Has anybody pitched it? I guess it's not easy to pitch to Netflix. Well, I, Dennis I, has a, a, a daughter who's in Hollywood. Well, so perfect. Got a connection there. There you go. <laughs> Dennis, well, yeah. well, she's in New York, but yeah, she does documentaries, and she's been doing a documentary on this, and she will try to uh, start pitching it. I, mean, I, think, I feel like the dramatization really wins the hearts over for most people. And the the route from fiction and pop culture, too. I think that there's a meta narrative here, right? Because what you're saying about Thomas North is that he lived through all of these things. He transmuted them into art. And that art then reflected on the changing of the political tides, on the opening of this age of reason. And I don't think that it's an accident that it comes by way of plays and art. Mm -hmm. I think that people really need to be able to see these mythological stories and examples of the human condition in order to be able to actually cast the events of their lives into something comprehensible. And, and not only that, but Thomas North actually said that which is what's really uh, amazing in the introduction to Plutarch's lives. Um, he has this um, passage where he says almost exactly that, that um, he's writing, you know, Plutarch's lives is, is a collection of biographies, but they're really a collection of stories about these figures. And they touch on these sort of political themes about what makes for a good ruler or, or, or a good citizen. And he explicitly says in the introduction to the book that uh, it's really stories that, you know, move people and help them to understand uh, these ideas. And, um, you know, we believe that that's exactly what he's doing in his plays. Like, it's really interesting that North's innovation or, or seed came from the looking back into history you look at this other time you find these stories you find a way to put them in front of people and i think that we're really missing these sorts of stories right now like shakespeare feels archaic like it feels like it is of a different world it's about this different time but the mythology of Thomas North, I think, is kind of timeless, where it's not told through the lens of political plays about rulers that people aren't necessarily thinking about anymore. It's just a really, really universal story about what it means to see the possibility of a, a different world. And well, I definitely, oh, yeah, sorry. No, 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 go ahead. I'll ramble for forever. <laughs> <laughs> I definitely think one of the reasons why the, the Shakespeare plays and poetry have, are so timeless is because they continue to touch on similar topics and themes that are important to us to the, to this day, you know, in terms of like, in terms of rulers, right? In terms of we have rulers in power, in terms of how much authority do we give to one person? You know, I think that continues to be an enormously uh, relevant question to us to this, to this day. Uh, in terms of gender, in terms of the equality between the sexes, that is a constant theme that has run throughout the plays, mm -hmm. you know, and, and in terms of, of just say the most famous romantic uh, 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 play, Rom Romeo and Juliet, is that you, you really see the Juliet, who is a younger woman, well, in, 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 the, in, the, in, the, in the play, she's actually quite young, is actually instructing Romeo on, the, on, on what it means to be truly in love. Like you actually see him in the process of the play. She is his teacher. She's, she, you know, he is trying to express his, his, his deepest desires for her. She's saying like, no, you're not hitting it on the mark. Let me tell you how to say it. <laughs> and this is like constantly running throughout the, the play. And you can tell he's just like, he's enamored with her because of that. And you see in other plays, Much Ado About Nothing, where you have Benedict and Beatrice, where this is the battle of the sexes, this constant back and forth. And you see, Again, like you have a, a, a female character who is, is extremely intelligent and is able to go back and forth with Benedict and who he thinks he, he's like uh, smarter than everybody, but he's met his match with her. 
Um, and this is again, just time and time again, you have uh, a lot of different things. And we, you know, I talked earlier about sexuality. You know, sexuality in terms of of the plays is is a very uh, um, he explores so many different aspects of sexuality. I think, uh, for example, the one thing that is a constant that you see through through a lot of the plays is the uh, of uh, of sexual jealousy or jealousy just in terms of um, uh, what it means to be in a relationship in terms of ownership. You see that in terms of plays like The Winter's Tale, which mm -hmm. Dennis brilliantly showed was definitely, an, uh, it started being an older play in the 1550s, uh, but that's an excellent uh, exploration of the insecurities of, of, of jealousy. And of course, the most famous of all is Othello. Othello is, is one of the most heart breaking stories you can come across you know you hear you have a story of these two people uh one who happens to be an african moor and a young woman who happens to be uh happens to be white you know and they're madly in love with each other and yet it all comes to to a horrible horrible end where he actually kills her and it's all because of of how he's being able to be influenced by iago and how iago manipulates him into actually believing that she's uh, unfaithful. So there's all these different things, these different, I mean, it can go on and on about just so many different things. I think Hamlet, which is my favorite play and a lot of other people's favorite play, you have the most famous passage in the whole entire canon, which is to be or not to be. And here you have something where someone's questioning their own existence or questioning existence at all. And like, really, it's hard to, it's hard. I know Dennis showed a comparison to an older, older passage in one of his translations, but it seems like here is someone who's really taking to heart what it means to be a human being and even questioning the reality of what is after death. And this is at a time where thing, everyone was enormously religious. Like, it's like religion played a, a huge role in everyone's life. And at, at no point really... Does does really does a, a Hamlet ever kind of come out and say, well, here's the solution mm -hmm. to to the my problem? Is it being like I'm just I, I lack faith or I lack um, some kind of? He's just constantly questioning. He's questioning. He's questioning his own motives. He's questioning his own ability to to do the job that he's been asked to do by his father's ghost. He's just constantly questioning, and then by the end of the play, his resolution is is acceptance but it's not necessarily faith it's it's uh what will come will come when i die i will die you know and and what's important again i want to tie it back to montaigne is that was something that montaigne continuously repeated again and again and mm -hmm. montaigne was very much uh uh obs i guess you could say obsessed with death and mortality and where martin came to that was that it was a, a matter of acceptance that it is what it is and to simply face it and 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 that way, uh, in, in both cases with Hamlet and Montaigne, it, it's not. There is no consolation in terms. Of, well, you're going to die, but you're going to go to heaven. That's not even really part of the, the discussion. If it is, it's just very brief. And I think that in and of itself, we live in such a secular society today. So when we look back at that time, and we think, well, okay, well, I mean, it's no big deal, right? Well, no, that was a big deal in those days. That that wasn't something that was common you don't see people really having that out there in the public so um i think that we we where we are today where we have a, i mean comparison to those days a great deal of freedom to express ourselves uh, of course there's a lot of restrictions and a lot of people will get ignored if they say the wrong thing but in those days there was a real true um just it was a a a, a uh, if you could compare it to, I guess, modern day countries where there's enormous control over what people do or think and say, whether it be North Korea or Iran or, or whatnot, um, you have, like, it wasn't that different then, you know, I mean, there's differences for sure, but there was enormous control there. Uh, and so, um, yeah, it was, it was, it was the Shakespeare canon is a, is a, is a, a, a in my mind was kind of like uh in many many ways the foundation of of like the modern era mm. Mm. i mean it certainly seems that way and i think that understanding it in that light as being something that comes from 
the lived experience of someone. Like this is what, what Dennis was saying, which is that you can take this and you can map it onto the chapters of someone's life where it's not fantasy. It, it, it's actually the, the real life consequences of, of actions and the, you know, the terrible mistakes that people make, which I think is a really valuable thing for us to eternally return to. And it will make a great TV series. So as I was writing, <laughs> as I was, as I was writing my book, I was just thinking, oh, this would make such a great film or a TV, you know. And I, I am not involved in writing screenplays at all whatsoever. But I was just like, you know, this would make a really good movie. Like just Thomas Norris' life and all these other people's uh, their lives and, and their stories would just be absolutely fascinating. Absolutely. Yeah. So into think- Go ahead. I, I was just going to comment on just to kind of um, add to what Derek was saying. Like, I think there's a tendency now to see Shakespeare as archaic, you know, especially in the language and some of the, you know, plots and, and themes. But, um, you know, there's a way in which it can be incredibly contemporary. And, you know, you there was a performance of Julius Caesar from the National Theater a few years ago where Julius Caesar comes in wearing a red MAGA hat. And, you know, just really... Uh, sort of uh, highlighted, you know, how we're still dealing with some of these same themes about, you know, as uh, Derek said, sort of how much power we invest in a ruler. Or like I've seen uh, versions of Tamia the Shrew where they switch the gender roles and have the men play by women and the, you know, women paid by men. Or I saw an all-female cast do Tamia the Shrew where the only male actor was the Shrew. And, you know, there's <laughs> ways that uh, this, these plays can be really timeless and really comment on um, you know, our own contemporary society and our own contemporary politics. And I think that just becomes even more apparent when you look at it through this this lens that we're promoting here, where even in Shakespeare's time, they were doing the same thing and using these stories to comment on their contemporary society and their contemporary politics. And I think looking at it through the lens of Thomas North and his life and his concerns sort of brings that out even even more and um, gives us a frame to then sort of take these ideas that he was preoccupied with, which really are timeless, and see what they have to say about our own time. And um, you know, I think that's why Shakespeare is still being performed today, 400 years later, and uh, you know, hasn't stopped. Does, uh, before we close, I wanted to just get your guys' prognostication about the future in terms of is it possible in our modern civilization to have this kind of a complete cultural renaissance occur again in the context of what would it look like? You know, what's, what's a modern equivalent of the church giving up its power and then people becoming interested in how to self rule and so forth. Like, would this be like some president, like closing down all of the academies and just handing over the, the research to independent people or like giving a bunch of YouTubers money to do science or what, what, what's like a modern equivalent that I can imagine in terms of what this would look like in, in civilization today. Is that, does anybody have any ideas? Uh, well, I could, I mean, I could imagine something occurring in, um, in totalitarian countries right now in which the control of information which is by uh dictators whether it's in uh russia or china or uh middle eastern nation and it opens up and becomes much uh freer and uh there's suddenly uh access information there would be that kind of revolution of ideas uh within them but a global phenomenon like that it, it it's hard to imagine um it's hard to imagine i do think it's possible i think it i think it has to happen organically and i think that um unfortunately sometimes um i think sometimes sometimes difficulties can make that happen i think if if people are a little too comfortable sometimes they're like really not willing to change and so i think that if if we were to see that because it is interesting because on the one hand, in in the, in the modern like sort of cultures, uh, first world culture uh, countries, right? There seems to be all this uh, all this freedom, all this ability. Everyone can express themselves. But you're right, though, in terms of openness to new ideas. How like even though Dennis is just putting evidence after evidence after evidence, hard evidence, like the, making his case, and yet there's just this 
this complete, just like rigid, rigid uh, uh, refusal to even acknowledge it. And I guess we like having this podcast and having done over 200 episodes with different academics and different experts and people from all corners of different disciplines. It's a recurring theme. Like this isn't just limited to this you know, <laughs> inquiry about Shakespeare. The idea of Nor to plurali- Dennis's ideas only about Shakespeare. I know that there's only one. So, yeah, plurality of theories is something we have a really hard time with. And I was going to say, like, right. you know, we made the joke earlier that conspiracy theories are frowned on on YouTube. But the truth is, the crazier conspiracy theories are totally fine on YouTube. The ones that get actually close to, to <laughs> making some sense, those get cut really quickly. Those get <laughs> trimmed away. And I think that that, in some sense, reflects... Uh, Something approximating the culture of this central monolithic uh, information source like the church. There is some some taste of the church, not in the religious sense, but in a secular sense that is still very much present. And uh, well, yeah, do you think that's coming? From, it's coming just from mass. Uh, do I want to say ignorance? Uh, inst- just instincts of in which they're just drawn to certain beliefs or certain ideas or tribalism or stability, right? I mean, stability is, it's really attractive. You know, if we, it would be really nice if we did understand how the universe began down to a fraction of a billionth of a second or something like if we, if we were really believed that and were confident in them, we were masters of the universe, you know? And so having this stable narratives that don't flex is in some sense really reassuring, I think, to most people. I actually have a slightly like more specific perspective on that, which is that I think that our society is largely, like we don't have monarchs as such anymore, but I do think that if we did have monarchs, they would be the, the tech kings of our world. And the tech kings don't have a theistic religion. They have a religion of rationality. And the manifestation of our utmost rationality is science. And you can say that scholarship about who wrote Shakespeare is not per se science, but I think that it falls under the bin of we have looked at the evidence We have put together a rational story, and that rational story is now something that we can rest our laurels on. And I get this feeling that there is, and this sounds kind of crazy when I say it out loud, but I think that there is an interplay between the power of the tech sphere and the settling of ideas and the locking in of ideas. Because in order for scientism to be reasonable it has to be right and you can't have a plurality of theories if the basis for what you do in society is that the theory that you're using at the moment is right and so it feels very much like it's this institutional closing down of possibility because i've i've put this in front of people before but it feels like you have the emergence of christianity as this cult like religion. It's small. There's teachings that are particular. It takes about 300 years for it to become the religion of the state. Science emerges roughly 300 years ago, give or take, and now it's becoming the religion of the state. And with that comes the cessation of possibility. And so I think that it it, it ties into a larger... Yeah, it's just so hard for me to hear this discussion without thinking about a lot of these academic uh, constrictions and so forth that we're, that we're always encountering on this show. Yeah, and it just, it seems like it's, it's in you, it's, it's for some reason. Like, it's not accidental. I think that it, it, when you close down the options available to you in terms of how the world works, then you have created something that you can place all of your faith into. And that seems to be where we're headed. But I definitely think that power, it, in order for power to work, it has to have belief systems behind it. So I think that in order for power to really truly operate, they have to change the belief systems over time because eventually the old, the old belief systems get, they just no longer really have weight with, with people. So you have to have new ways of looking at things. And, um, and obviously, if, if you have new ideas come out that challenge the status quo, 
then you know it has to be you know uh tossed into a corner and be and and then like and and, uh, and we we brought up the idea of conspiracy theories a few times today and i think that's it's actually become uh a way to dismiss something so if you have anybody uh where who's uh, bringing something absolutely new they uh they will oftentimes will be called a conspiracy theorist you know and just like that's just an easy way to shut people up and just have people just ignore them and i think that the problem for for example for dennis and, and for michael and for myself too as well and june schluter is that there's there's been so many people who've come before dennis mm -hmm. on this topic that they just automatically just throw him into the same bag even though what he's doing is is quite quite different and uh so i just think that uh, i do believe in the possibility I'm, I'm big on possibilities so i believe it's possible for a, a renaissance to take place uh i think it, it has to happen organically and um and i think that the seeds just sort of like in what i explore in my book is that i feel like the, the seeds for the age of reason were already happening during the english renaissance the italian renaissance i think the seeds of it were happening then it started then and then it kind of came to fruition later on like uh, during that period I think you could see the seeds of more uh, openness to different possibilities already happening now. I think the possibilities uh, of that happening are happening right now. It just uh, sometimes you need to have certain events take place for it to, to really uh, come to fruition. Yeah, I guess I have a more optimistic view as well. I, I feel like, uh, you know, I don't, I don't see it as, as a, inevitable sort of closing of, of minds. I see it as a back and forth over time, maybe be just because I'm, you know, an investigative journalist and, you know, my whole, uh, you know, reason is is to, you know, put ideas out there and try to change minds through through storytelling. And, you know, you just see over and over again, I think people like black and white thinking and they, they get entrenched in, in their ideas. And, you know, when new ideas come along, whether it's, you know, in science, you can look at plate tectonics or quantum physics or things, you know, that people, you know, initially very um, um, not open to receiving, but, you know, eventually, eventually went out. And, um, but, you know, it's not a fight that ever ends. I mean, you see the resurgence of religion right now, you see the resurgence of authoritarianism all over the world, and, you know, even in this country, potentially, and, and uh, you know, you get, just got to, you know, continually um be putting out the the truth and living in that that gray area where i think you know a lot of um a lot of our lives really are are lived i don't think there really are such such strong black and whites and i think by questioning things and by you know constantly um challenging received wisdom you know that's the only way that we make progress as long as you don't question quantum mechanics or plate tectonics, you should be <laughs> <Yeah>. fine. <laughs> I mean, you know, I'm open to anything. I'm, I'm a skeptical mind. <laughs> uh, I, I agree with that interpretation. I am actually optimistic that, the, that this theory and most uh, um, reasonable theories will win out in the end. And eventually there will be, be people without this emotional attachment uh to various candidates for example and uh will be more readily to accept thomas north on just on the facts uh and i think that's true but it does it it does take decades and i think that's just because of human nature and because of uh and i think that's going to be true with the problem with the multiple theories that people can't uh um accept possibilities or we don't know yet about the universe and there's different versions of possibilities that may be true and just be that open-minded and uh you can see that there may be some top-down pressure on that or it's just natural that people are like that but it's a very very resistant force to get people to uh to to just on logic alone to just look at evidence and go oh yeah i was wrong all my life and this is true um it's just a it's just a uphill battle I, I appreciate the optimism. <laughs> yeah, I think that's a really good good place to close down. I, I, I think that there. I think if you look back over history, it's certainly there is a spirit of forward 
I, I at least, I don't know, it's like, do you believe, believe in progress? I mean, it's, there's a lot of evidence that, that we're living a much better lives today than our ancestors 50,000 years ago. So Sometimes it takes people a thousand years to come back to atomism, yeah. though. You yeah. know, it's yeah. like, I, I think that these yeah. things, there's absolutely a pendulum of history, but I'm like, I think that history is marred by very, very long swings of that <laughs> pendulum. And For sure. I don't know. We'll we'll see how I think that we'll see it play out over the course of our lifetimes, right? Because it's it seems at this inflection point right now, like it could swing in the direction. <laughs> Fingers crossed. Yeah, doing our little part. Yeah, as long as we don't get banned off YouTube for peddling conspiracy theories about Shakespeare. <laughs> Um, t- how about uh, you we'll guys? Put links to all, all your books. But can you plug your work like one by one? just so that people like know where, where to find, find you, you and yeah. where they can follow up on your people ideas. Sure. Uh, I'm Thomas North. I, my, the book on the subject is Thomas North, the original author of the Shakespeare Canon, which you can find on, uh, on uh, Amazon, or you can go to uh, sirthomasnorth.com, which is my website. also links to the book. I also, my name's Dennis McCarthy, and I have a sub stack. Hit subscribe or, you know, just read it. Excellent. And my book is called In Shakespeare's Shadow, and it's about uh, looking at Dennis and uh, his scholarship, but also looking at Thomas North and really investigating that theory. And June Schluter. And June Schluter. <laughs> <laughs> we, we have to get June Schluter on the show. Yes. A really integral part yes. of, of the story. And uh, I'm working on a new book now, which should be out next year, about the Hobby Lobby Corporation and uh, its uh, links to Christian fundamentalism and Christian nationalism. So also, you know, uh, considering really, really big ideas and really challenging. Um, this is going to be big. <laughs> ideas about yeah, I really think. Yeah, definitely. Well, I, we'd love to have you back when you when you get it done. I know that while you're writing, it can be a tricky time to talk about stuff, yeah. but. <laughs> Absolutely. All right, yeah, Derek, you want to close us out? Sure. Yeah, I'm very excited about both of their future works. You know, I, I, and Dennis has some future books on on uh, on North as well. I'm super excited about, and uh, and 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 Michael's books. You know, for me, uh, that topic uh, sounds uh, very uh, very much up my alley, and and it's gonna. I'm looking for him to uh, to shake shake some uh, shake some things up. You know, so that's <laughs> that's, that's going to be really cool. Um, for, so for me, my book that is related to, uh, to Thomas North and to Shakespeare is called Anonymous Agnostic Antichrist. Uh, and I, I explain what the title means uh, on my website. So my website is uh, love-chaos.com. So L-O-V-E-C-H-A-O-S.com. Um, I also have a, a Facebook group that I do, which is called Love Chaos. Also, please go check out um, the North Shakespeare Facebook group. There's a ton of stuff on there. A lot of stuff that Dennis Dennis's work is on there. Michael's work is on there. Uh, you see me posting stuff in there as well. Uh, but I, we're 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 active, you know, online and, and engaging people. And so for me, uh, it, the anonymous agnostic antichrist was a a project that I've been uh, working on for the past thirty years. Uh, it's informed by a lot of research. Uh, but it is a work of fiction. It's a work of literature, and it tells the story of Thomas North and 13 other authors. And so it's mostly about North, but it's also about the people who I believe uh, helped him to uh, create the Shakespeare canon and tell their personal personal lives. And by all means, if there's a really great screenwriter listening to this or watching this <laughs> and you want to turn it into a miniseries or movie, please reach out to me because I definitely feel it has a lot of cinematic uh opportunities and uh i'm currently right now in the beginning of a new project uh it's uh, a 20-year project and it's uh going to be 78 short stories that'll be uh re- basically expressing the 78 tarot cards and so each short story will represent the nature of tarot cards and so uh yes i uh, i'm into into a lot of different stuff you can find out more about me on love dash chaos uh over there very cool. I love the timelines that you work on. That reassures me <laughs> about my own production yeah. schedule. Yeah, it's it's one of the advantages of, of 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 being an independent publisher, as you can just publish things when exactly when you want, and you have complete and total control. So it's it's one of the things that I enjoy doing. 
It's fantastic. I, I mean, thank you all for coming. It was a really fantastic conversation. I really appreciate that we could schedule all three of you because I think that you really offered the complete picture that we wouldn't <laughs> have been able to get otherwise. I think we got a lot deeper than we did with our first conversation with Dennis. But And I salute your contribution to the next renaissance, all of you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Terrific. Thank well, you. Thank, thanks for the great interview. Thanks for the great question. Thank you very much. Thank you all so much. All right. Good yeah, luck out there, everybody. Guys. Much appreciated. This was great. Yeah. Thank you. Have a great rest of your day and and bye to everybody listening. See you next time.